Ugh. Somebody once told me. Stop me if you've heard this one before. We're not made of jello. We get behind a flow. Black and yellow. And then they land a plane. For those of you who are new to this channel, B-Movie is a 2007 comedy film released by DreamWorks, which details the adventures of a series of titular bees. For the past two years, I have dedicated my time and resources towards reviewing and discussing every single bee in the B-Movie franchise. If you were to tell the average DreamWorks fan that this film has at its borders not only so many interesting characters, but specifically so many fascinating bees, then they might respond, what are you doing in my house? The sad thing about these bees is that they frankly have failed to stay relevant in the hysteria of modern animation. People just don't have time to admire them because they're too busy looking at other pieces of animation which have come out since. And it's ignorant misconceptions like that which have inspired me to take a closer look at this iconic film. One B at a time. I can autograph that if you want. Little gusty out there today, wasn't it, comrades? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fucking jocks, can you believe this asshole? Look at <laughs> Right? <laughs> <laughs> the pollen jocks are a group of bees in the film series who serve as an important narrative role, as they are the group that entices our very own Bee Benson into leaving the hive in the first place. They're buff and muscular, clearly bred to be the best of the bees as to survive outside of the hive. But the pollen jocks would be almost nothing without their intelligent general, Lou Lo Ducka, or as I like to call him, Lou Lo Lo Duck Lover. Now this bee is most notably portrayed by Rip Torn, a voice actor who is often misidentified as a regular actor due to his roles in Men in Black and Freddy Got Fingered, which he got because he has such a great voice. The first time we see Lolo Duck Lover is when he is preparing to have the other pollen jocks take off when they are joined by our main protagonist better known as the Seinfeld Bee. What's important here is that the sergeant is accepting of Benson, allowing him into the troop. This tells us that bees are not racist, and they don't hate Benson just because he wasn't bred to be a pollen jock. Bees are super accepting and overall cool dudes, and it's here that he lays down the basic laws of being a bee, which are important because they tell us the bee laws. Bee law number one, absolutely no talking to humans. All right! Bees can't talk. So the next time we see the Drill Sergeant Bee is when all the other bees have given up on doing work. The Sergeant is the one who sends the bees into motion, which is important because this is the bees deciding to come and help Bee Benson land a plane. Without the Sergeant, that plane never would have landed. Which is pretty unrealistic. They're trying to illustrate bees as some sort of hyper-intelligent species that could support a plane just by flying underneath its wings, but in actuality, bees are bee, bees are pretty stupid. I've, se I've seen a bee fly into a lawnmower because it was confused by the smell. I've, I've, I've seen a bee just- I stepped on a bee before. What a, what a fucking stupid thing. What a, a stupid bee. How am I supposed to- Caleb? Are you making noise in the dungeon? I told you, you better not be trying to get out of there. Hey? Okay? I will come in there, and you don't want that. You gotta stop bumping the mic, okay, little baby? Meow. Meow. Come here. Hop up. Hop up. Come here. Come here. Come here. You are the sweetest little thing. I love you. If this is the best that the B-movie bees have to offer, then I am shocked that so few people have found these elements to be as amazing as I have. Next week, we're going to be looking at another character. And while I think that I'm going to enjoy doing this, I doubt that it's going to be something that I think about a lot. Until then, this has been Quentin Reviews, and that's all you bees. World is gonna roll me, I ain't In my last review, I made quite the bold claim. I expected that while I would enjoy the bee in this review, it would also form- It wouldn't be something that I would think about a lot. Me and Caleb, my ex-co-producer and current housemate, 
picked up this belief as a self-defense mechanism. We realized that if we went into this expecting Bob Bumble to be as great as the viewers of the news within this movie deserved, we would leave disappointed within the heavily prevalent actuality that he was in fact very bad. But I'm happy to say that we were both blown away. Bob Bumble perfectly encapsulates the dated eccentricity of a local news anchor. The intoxicating swagger, the buzzed facial hair, the chubby, middle-aged exterior. Perhaps it is best put by the official B-movie reference book, A Guide to the Sweet Life. News heavyweight Bob Bumble is the anchor on The Hive at 5 TV News. Every evening, Bob and his team get to the bottom of all the day's top stories. Live from The Hive. Mustache, immaculately trimmed curly white teeth, and finally, the trademark stripey suit. Bumble appears at several points throughout the original B-movie. The first time he's seen is about 41 minutes in, when he's seen presenting the news that Barry B. Benson is indeed planning on suing the human race. Shown at the anchor desk, he beautifully exemplifies the exact manner of speech and coverage that we're used to see in mainstream media. Bob Bumble is, in fact, really only heard one other time in the movie. And that's when he's seen reporting on the news that Barry is attempting to land a plane on his own, clearly representing the shock and the terror of the situation with full force. And this helps us immerse ourselves into the B-talking human surviving belief stretch that is the first B-movie. Bob Bumble isn't featured in the B-movie video game, where his assistant Jeanette Chung truly takes center stage. But that's really a video for another day. All that can really be said is that Bob left an impact on the audience, and that's all that will ever matter. Listen, DreamWorks, here are the steps to make B-Movie 2 a B in the life much better than the first one. Step 1. Write out Jerry Seinfeld. Step 2. More Bob Bumble. Step 3. Uh, step 2 again. Buzz you. I was almost afraid that the lack of this character's true presence in the film would leave me in a strange seat, where I would come to find myself unable to judge or appreciate this B due to them not really being featured. If I couldn't see this bee, if I couldn't understand who he is, then how was I ever to decide if he was a good bee or not? But I then went and saw the cinematic masterpiece that is the Emoji Movie, which is all about looking past how people like to be perceived to instead look at how they truly are on the inside. And thus it soon occurred to me that even though this specific bee is never seen in the movie, it is fine to review him entirely off of the premise of exposition alone. And just hearing about the exploits of this bee made me want to say, mm. Mm, That's not it. <laughs> Frankie the Bee has a life so stereotypical and predictable that I have no doubt that I will be able to illustrate his life simply by using clips of bees from other films. Frank's only mention in Bee Movie comes about when a mournful Broderick Bee brings up his death to a very passive Barry B. Benson. Frankly, has apparently died because of an encounter that he had outside of the hive, which led to him stinging a squirrel. As all bees are taught from birth, stinging someone can lead to death. Because of this, Benson is dismissive of the idea of going to his funeral. This is important because it tells us a lot about what we need to know about bee society. Most bees rarely leave the hive, and yet are expected to have a reasonable knowledge of the outside world simply through reports on television. They are expected to live a life on the edge, but can't even use their main source of defense without dying in the process. But Frankie's role in the movie also serves as an early hint about Benson's immediately growing distance from the rest of his peers. Not only will he soon grow uninterested in the honey industry, but the death of one of his closest peers that he has known his whole life barely even comes to phase him. Instead, he chastises death, blaming him for the incident and refusing to even pay tribute because of this. That's all you bees. Shed. She was looking kind of dumb with her finger and her thumb and Ain't singing for Pepsi Ain't singing for Coke I don't sing for nobody Cause everyone's pulled their ads A YouTube career can be a terrifying landscape where you're never sure if you're going to make a thousand dollars or six dollars 
Because of this, in desperate situations, desperate measures are sometimes in order. Which is why, near the end of 2016, I created my very own Patreon account. One of the first things I set up was a tier for fan requests, at around the moderate price of $36. Now there are pros and cons to trying to create videos as suggested by your fans. You have a direct window to some of your biggest fans and what they like of your content. You get to talk about subjects that you otherwise would never have considered and you get to hear about up-and-coming content creators that your fans admire. But on the other hand, what you want to do and what your fans want you to want to do are often very different things, and it can be somewhat hard to try and force yourself into second-hand investment. Continuously doing fan requests is also an easy way to stagnate and fail at growing, because your fans often want you to just make more of what you've been making, while you might be interested in evolving and moving on. My second Patreon request video was so bad that I actually changed the rules so that it wouldn't happen again. Again. And the exact same day that that video came out, I got my third request, which is the one we're doing right now. It has been more than six months since I got this request, and once you see what it was, you'll understand why I kept putting it off. The request was for a bee called Maya the Bee. Uh, uh? Now, technically, the rules of this tier only said that you had to request a B. There was a technicality where it never said that the B had to be from B Movie, so I had no reasonable reason to turn this person down. Meaning that I had to review a B that wasn't even in B Movie, entirely for financial gain. I had Seinfeld it out. Maya the Bee is a German comic character and film star who was first used in a book published in 1912. You might thus correctly predict that Maya the Bee has had a long history as a character, having survived both world wars and still being mildly relevant today. Maya's first on-screen appearance took place in 1924, when she and her friends were played by actual, real insects. That's good stuff. But her main market appearance seems to have come about somewhere around the mid-1970s, when she was the star of her own Japanese animation. Weird, right? Like, how did the Japanese even have any contacts with the German people? Seems like those two groups have no connections whatsoever. Most recently, Maya has been featured in a little project called Maya the Bee Movie. Or perhaps better put, Maya the Bee Movie leading to many people to joke that Maya the Bee Movie was a knockoff of THE Bee Movie. Maya the Bee almost seems more like a character from Pixar's A Bug's Life. Many of her plots seem to revolve around her getting into hijinks with her friends, and the modern animation style certainly harkens back more to Pixar than DreamWorks. Now I just want to stop to say that I know that many of you are not invested in this topic. In fact, I believe if we check my social blade, yep, that's, that's lower than it used to be. Okay. Uh, is Masaki still relevant? Uh, do you guys want to open some Masaki mail? Alright, just in case the YouTube generation has already switched up in the past six months, uh, Masaki used to be this guy that, uh, he was a real big, uh, internet gag with, uh, people who were fans of a guy named Idubs. Now, the reason that he was a joke was that, uh, you could be racist to him and he would play along with it, and, uh, people liked that freedom. I tried to do this, but, uh, I made a Chinese teacher cry once, so I have a lot of white guilt, uh, so I couldn't really go through with it, but, uh, the, the, the appeal of his site is that there is no appeal, and people just, uh, people just shit on it, and no one uses it, and he gives free stuff to YouTubers, and somehow that's a business. There's some scam involved at some level of Masaki that hasn't been discovered yet, and I can say all this because I'm not getting paid for this shit. Alright, and it looks like we're looking at, uh, uh, some sort of B. Benson action figure here. That's sort of what we got going. It's, uh, it's a good one. It's a good one. I like this one. What else we got here? We're looking at some B-movie spoons. These are nice. These are nice. These are, uh... They look, uh... Are these... These might be, uh, fresh out of the package. They look kind of vacuum sealed, don't they? And you got a little B. Benson on the top. Sort of having a little adventure. Uh, you know, maybe a heart attack as well. Might be able to use that for some... If you were doing something with honey. Uh, otherwise you could just use that for anything that you would use a spoon for. It's a quality... Quality set of spoons. And, uh... This is looking like some sort of... 
It's a button of some kind. It's got a pollen jack on it. Ah, for the life of me, I'm pressing it. I don't know what it does. Tom, this is another serious escalation. North Korea firing a missile that crossed over Japanese airspace, something it's done before, but not without warning or at a time of such escalating tension. And this, this is looking like uh, McDonald's um, instruction pack on how to use the Barry Benson doll. I guess that fell out. That's very useful. And uh, this, is a, this is a Meet the Robinsons uh, Pez dispenser. That's a weird thing to include. You're a sick motherfucker, Misaki. Now back to Maya the Bee. So far I've made it pretty clear that there's nothing exactly sustainably bad about Maya the Bee, and yet uh, people aren't exactly fond of her. And the question is, if she's not bad, why isn't she popular? The answer is Nazis. Maya the Bee not only has the misfortune of being something that people will always compare to the greatest cinematic masterpiece of all time, but she also happens to be something that was created two years before the First World War. And thus the original texts have come to represent many things which have since been shunned in the scholarly community. In the original novel, Maya represents views and actions which can only be compared to speciesism, in a sense. At one point, when incorrectly referred to as a wasp, she claims that they are a useless gang of bandits that have no home or faith. When she meets a fly that doesn't respect bees, she threatens it with her stinger and promises to teach it respect for bees. There are very strange militaristic overtones in the book, which look very bad in the hindsight of what these ideas would lead Germany to do. Huh, I wonder how my subscriber rate is- Uh oh! Ah shit, I knew this would happen if I called a beloved childhood icon a Nazi! New segment, new segment, anything new segment- Ah! Uh -oh. Hi Wyatt, how you uh, doing? Hi. Hey, so uh, well, we're gonna play a little game here. Uh, it's called, uh, Wyatt Receiver. Would you fuck this bee? This bee? This bee. We're gonna see if you can fuck uh, any of these bees. Alright, any of these. They're gonna be bees. bees. Are, you, right. are you ready for yeah. this? Do you fuck that bee? Um. Yeah. Looks looks good. <laughs> looks. Yeah. What about this one? bee? It's got some thorax there. I like the I like the shot. Maybe. Real. Yeah. So, yes. A cartoon, an image. Yeah, I like the, like the infantilized uh, like children's drawing. Of this bee, and yeah, I would have had sex with it. What about that one? Yeah, um, it looks almost angry. No, I think that would be a good, a good one, a good time. What about this one? Is this from Looney Tunes? What is this? Might be. I don't. It's know. another cartoon, so the answer is yes, obviously. But that's uh, looks like a male bee. Okay. <laughs> That's good too. I like it. And I had, yeah. It barely even looks like a bee. Yeah, it's weird, but good. <laughs> and then we've got these two. Like man and wife bee. And yeah. I definitely want to get in the middle of that. All right, cool. And the transform. Oh, Bumblebee, the transformer. Is the that. Transforming robot. Does that one count to you? Yeah, like a car. In car form? Or bee? Right. Very, the B form, I'd say. Yeah, the B. The, well, it's not a B, but yes. And uh, Jerry Seinfeld, yeah. Uh, comedy TV. And, and then the same, the same one. What's his name? Barry? Some Barry Benson? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Like we already know, he's he punches well above his weight. He, he's with a human woman in that movie. Yeah, you're right. And so, I think knowing that he likes people, <laughs> that I would have a chance with with Barry. And so you yes. got it. You yeah. got it. Well, why? I've got yeah. good news and bad news. You won the game. Won the game. But you lost because you couldn't think of uh, Barry B. Benson's full name. Barry B. Benson. So I'm gonna take you home uh, to my house. I'm gonna cut you up into tiny pieces, and I'm gonna. I'm gonna put you in the bucket that I use to feed Caleb. Yeah, the bucket. Uh, yeah. All right. So we're just gonna put that back right. over the head and start. <laughs> Come here, baby. Meow. Meow, meow, meow. Baby. Puss, puss. You're bumping the mic again. 
baby, it'll mess up the audio. Most people won't notice, but some people will. And if you bump the camera, everyone will notice. Puss, puss. Come here. No, come here, though. Come here. For real? You don't want to come here. But you do want to keep bumping the camera. That's your objective? Oh. I almost feel bad for Maya the Bee. I mean, she's had some nice specials. She, she's doing well for herself. Nothing really to hate. But, uh... She's not Jerry Seinfeld, so, uh... Fuck her. Best notes for you. Uh, B plus. Shape of an L on her forehead. Well... What do you mean you just started recording? I thought we could stop and watch the first video that I ever created for the Quentin Reviews YouTube series. For context, I was 15 or 16 when I made this. Uh, hi. There My he is. My name is Quentin Kyle Hoover. Oh, yeah, say the full name. You gotta get that branding out. Uh, this is a series that I, I've been thinking about doing a while, called uh, Qu Quentin Reviews. Quentin so, Reviews. So like there's, I said, there I've been goes. thinking about doing this for a while, but I've Have never really you. had the driving force or the reason to do it. So, so what made me want to make a review series? Well, just a little obscure film no. by the name no, of. No, don't. Don't do it. Over the Hedge. Fuck you. Fuck yes, you. Yes, this 18-year-old comic was first Fuck released you. in 1995. And as since there Fuck has been many, you. there's been plenty to celebrate. God there's damn been it. Books. Like I said, people have been doing a job of celebration that's just just been going over going over the hedge, you know? And, and, and I know that people are going to continue to celebrate this fantastic comic series, just like my audience will no doubt, will no doubt celebrate my goatee. <sighs> Fuck me. Wow, what I think we can all learn here is that you have to keep improving, even if you're me. Anyways, I'm gonna review Dean Buswell now. B movie, B uh, B B movie, I I I review B movie. Through all of B movie, the B commonly known as Dean Buswell actually appears several times. And in each occurrence, he serves under a totally different title in a totally different job in a totally different part of the hive to someone who has only seen B-Movie once or twice, an easter egg like that might otherwise pass them by. In a way, Buswell comes to represent the workaholic nature of the bee species, being so preoccupied with making honey that he's constantly switching up personas and positions from minute to minute just to get the job done. The first time we see Buswell is in the briefest of roles, during the graduation ceremony where he simply approaches the podium as the Dean of the Hive as he announces the end of the ceremony. Yeah, and that concludes our graduation ceremonies. Yay! This, again, sets you into the tone of the honey-making environment, that everything goes quickly and there is no time for recreation. It is the main thesis of the entire scene, which is all set up easily by the quick punchline and execution. The next time we see Mr. Buzzwell is when Barry and the Broderick Bee go to the job placement board. He is shown to be the person running the actual board, and he has some interesting dialogue to be said. Couple of newbies? Yes, sir! What do you mean, newbies? Of course they're newbies! You're running the desk that has people select their first and only job! Everyone's gonna be newbies! What could you- Oh! Oh! Newbies! Bees that are new! Oh. That's, that's qu- HEY! <coughs> Tensions and puns aside, one of the strangest moments in terms of the animation of the film happens during this scene. Well, whenever a bee dies, that's an opening. See that? He's dead, dead, another dead one, deady, deadified, two more dead, dead from the neck up, dead from the neck down. But that's life. You'll find that with animation, there's this kind and well-kept balance between the amount of humor that the voice actor provides and the amount that the animation provides. You Scots sure are a contentious people. You just made an enemy for life. This is a case where the voice actor knows exactly how to say the line to make the bit funny. But the animators are unable to keep up with the pace. 
We should see quick cuts, Buzzwell flying all around the board, pointing at things that indicate the death of bees, being direct and up close with a steady pace. Instead, what we're shown is Buzzwell pointing at apparently the whole board while indicating to specific vacancies and mimicking the death of some of the bees. It's a good bit that's ruined by bad animation. Buzzwell's next appearance is the first to indicate his high stature in the bee society, as he is the one that gives the ultimate order to shut down honey production. We need to shut down! Shut down! Shut down, shut down. <laughs> shut down honey production! <laughs> <laughs> shut it down! <laughs> Buzzwell's choice here is the most important in the film, as it is one of the contributions that leads to the destruction of most of the plant life on Earth, as bees no longer hunting for pollen means that plants are no longer being fertilized. Keep in mind that this exact same situation nearly causes Barry and Vanessa- HEY! Oh no! Get over here! What did I tell you? What did I say, huh? I said you couldn't come out of that room! Now you're trying to escape on me! You think you're a big man, huh? Well, who's the big man now? We then see Buzzwell playing solitaire, but the cards are shaped like honeycombs. Ha ha ha, classic! Start coming and they don't stop coming. To Let's talk B-movie honey containers. So there are a lot of literal and figurative moving parts in B-Movie. Benson's infatuation, Vanessa's boyfriend's reaction to this, Adam's crippling addiction to Cinnabons, the whole plane fiasco. But the main plot of B-Movie is as follows. A bee discovers that humans are stealing honey and decides to sue all of humanity. Now this being the premise of the film is certainly the main complaint from many of its detractors. That guy stole my reasonable good looks! And my tattoo! Why don't you sue him in court? Sue him in court? Cause that would be really boring to watch! There's certainly more funny things you could do with the premise than just having the cast sit in a courtroom arguing with each other while Oprah, actual literal Oprah, tries her best to litigate. It causes quite the confusion since we're left with a real mixed bunch of morals left over. Maybe the lesson is that you shouldn't steal, even from nature. If so, then what does the twist at the end really do? Where it turns out that getting rid of the bees got rid of the flowers and that's evil now, and Barry's interference was now a bad thing. Is it a lesson to leave well enough alone? To fight for justice, even when that justice doesn't really make for a great film? I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure anyone involved knew either. It's like they wrote all these scenes thinking that there was probably going to be a moral to somebody, and then they just kind of forgot. Still better than Sausage Party though. But the biggest hypocrisy of the entire film was the branding. Not only plastering every wall and even bits of the sky with ads for the feature, but even going as far as to do the very same thing that the main character was against. That's right, B-Movie, a film against releasing honey exclusively for humans, had its own line of honey. And I got some, so I decided to eat it. Hello and welcome to the start of what may be the end of my life, and I'm saying that because I'm going to eat honey that is clearly expired in an attempt to review this bee. This is really a fascinating product because it uh, represents some sort of hypocrisy in the hands of the creators of this film. I don't know, there's just something charming about how much it doesn't make sense in the context of all B-movie merchandise and products. Now, as you can see at the top of this, it says that it that these actually are uh, expired uh, in November 2009, which again is why I might not be living through this video. You know, it's funny. Uh, the re the only reason I'm doing this is because honey is supposed to not be able to expire. I I always heard they've discovered this when they found honey in a in a in a tomb of some sort of uh, Egyptian. Uh, I don't know, king or something. I don't, I don't know what's the deal with Egyptians. But I've always thought that was amusing. Like, who, you know, who did they have test that one out, you know what I mean? They found some honey and they're just like, Hey, Billy, come here! We need you to eat this! So just scoop it right out. Okay. This might be really gross. I'd like to imagine that this is just honey. I think a lot of bee, I think a lot of honey companies like add shit to honey. 
to just put on the shelf, you know what I mean? Sort of like milk, I guess. I like to imagine that this is actually entirely honey because it says berries, busy bee, pure honey on the front. But if not, I'm gonna die. Yeah. Yeah, that seems fine. Yeah, I guess this honey is good. I could I could use this, I guess, to cook something. And I did! It was a spinach banana smoothie thing. Had some oats in it, kind of a breakfast thing. I know it's not exactly me, but I'm trying to lose some weight, so I decided maybe I should eat a little bit better. Good stuff. I also started going to the gym the same day. Haven't gone again, though. I need some chicken McNuggets. But I, I still think this is a big insult to the whole point of B-Movie. The whole, the actual plot, the, literally what happens in B-Movie, but uh... What can I say? Honey is honey. Yeah, and that's all you bees. Go away. Bitch, you still recording? So I hate re-uploads, but this is one of them. While intended for November, this video was originally uploaded on December 1st, 2017. And immediately it became one of my most popular uploads. But before even clicking the publish button, I realized that I had a copyright claim. Now what I should have done was taken the video down and changed the segment immediately. And I really decided that even if I wasn't going to be able to make money off of it, that I wanted to release the video as soon as possible. Despite this fact, I countered the claim, and that came around to bite me in the ass because the company officially filed a takedown notice as of today. So I decided to just take down the video, change the segment, and then re-upload it. The positive is that, in this case, I now officially own this video, and this is honestly just what I should have done from day one. Thank you for your understanding, and please enjoy. In my last video, I was slightly more cynical of B-Movie than I usually am. <sighs> now, this was because I was honestly feeling a little bit dejected for the, in terms of my whole purpose on this channel. Usually, it feels like when I make a video about a B-Movie B, as I always have, that I'm taking something, I'm taking something, and I'm, I'm converting that into B-movie, you know? And I don't know, I guess just recently I, I haven't felt the same drive to convert everything into B-movie that I used to. Whew, but that is that gone, because wow! Like today, then only today, for the first time today, I just feel like... I'm converting B-Movie into itself, and I'm fucking ready to go! Well, it may be tempting to only discuss bees within B-Movie who have speaking roles or who are mentioned by the main cast. One of the most essential and often overlooked category of B is that of the background character. Filling the often endless scenery and creating a true sense of the world. Sadly, it can be hard to discuss many of these because of the lack of names to call the characters by. Without names, it's hard to keep track of which characters appear where. And what possible subcontinuity would be achieved by that is totally lost. The best moment in terms of a background character taking center stage occurs seven minutes into the film, when Barry and Adam pass by a gas pump and we see a bee putting honey into his car. As the bee glances at Adam and Barry, he briefly turns the pump on himself, taking a few glugs before being caught by the local bee paperboy. Nervously, he then shuffles back to his car and drives off. This is important for several reasons. For one, this is the first and one of the only moments in the film where any character seems to acknowledge the absurdity of honey being used for so many things within the hive. Be it hair gel, pool water, or just refreshments. This bee deciding to eat the honey that he is supposed to be putting in his car as he nervously glances around is the first sign that any bee finds this system counterintuitive. Furthermore, just the implication of the way he is animated and presented speaks volumes. He looks around like he is desperately in the need of honey, like some sort of honey junkie. I mean, we all have our faults, like my addiction to cocaine or my alcoholism. Tastes like hand sanitizer, that's how you know it's the good shit. And while the concept of a bee addicted to honey is somewhat within merit, the idea that he has any lack of honey elsewhere is not. 
Of all the places in the universe where this character could get honey, he chooses to use the tool meant for his car. Now just because this bee occasionally acts like a junkie doesn't mean that he is one. My point is that at the end of the day, this supposed honey addict is nothing more than a man. I mean bee. A bee who has looked at the overarching system developed by other bees far above his pay grade and has proved willing to push the boundaries and do what he sees as the best above all else. In drinking from that gas pump, this bee showed a vision for the future, and for that, he deserves to be commended. Truly an unsung hero of our times. And with that, I've been quitting reviews, and that's all you need. B. That's that's all you be. Although the phrase, that's all you be, I just realized it doesn't make any sense, but the, the phrase, that's all you need, it's got a horrible ring to it as well. So that's all you be, whatever, I don't care. I'm too sexy for my shirt, too sexy for my shirt, so sexy it hurts. Ground running, didn't make sense not to live for fun. Your brain gets smart, but your head gets dumb. So much to do, so much to see, so what's wrong with taking? It's Christmas, and you know what that means. Christmas content. Or, as I've been told, that is. You see, I have a lot of YouTuber friends, and they're all really shocked that I found any success doing this little web series, and, um... And they, they started telling me, you know, you gotta keep up with the algorithm. You gotta, you, you gotta, you know, find, find the math and all that. And they said, you gotta do Christmas videos. You gotta do Christmas videos. And I... I don't... I don't know what Christmas videos to do for the life of me. I mean, I... I review bees from one one DreamWorks movie, and that's my job, and I, I'm supposed to do a Christmas video. I did go out of my way. I purchased a bee movie Christmas, or, Christmas ornament, uh, a real thing, and that was pretty cool. You know, it was a little, little nice trinket. I didn't understand why it had wheels. It had wheels. It's a Christmas ornament. Why does it need wheels that function? I mean, now that I think about it, do, would the bees in bee movie celebrate Christmas? I mean, I mean, does that ornament even make sense? I mean, not because they're bees, but... They're also like, like, Barry is like the, the bee variation of, of Jewish. So, would he celebrate Christmas? Did you celebrate Christmas? I've never looked that up. I mean, I'm not Christian. I celebrate Christmas. I think it's more of like an American thing. I, 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 Larry King had a Christmas tree, I think. So, so maybe there is Christmas. I guess I'll just review B Larry King then. If he celebrates Christmas, that, I think that works. The key appealing factor of B-Movie is the bizarre surrealism that leaves the audience constantly on their toes for the next moment. It's this electric atmosphere that has landed the film its great legacy, and the film's destiny is fully realized after Barry announces his plan to sue the human race, and he is immediately interviewed by none other than B. Larry King. Now, for those of you who are unaware due to his semi-retirement seven years ago, Larry King was once the host of Larry King Live, a very popular interview show on CNN. King would often discuss topical events with various celebrities, sometimes due to gossip, but mostly just due to publicity. Infamously, to promote B-Movie and probably to complete the gag, Jerry himself appeared on King's show, which led to the interview quickly going to commercial after Jerry became extremely triggered at something that King asked. Lasted how long? Nine years. 180 episodes. You gave it up, right? I did. Sir. They didn't cancel you. You canceled them. You're not aware of this? No, I'm, I'm asking you. You think I got canceled? Are you under the impression I, that I, I got canceled? You, have I hurt you, Jerry? I thought don't, that was pretty well documented. Don't this is most a, shows is this still go CNN? Down. Don't most shows go down a little? Most people do also. You would, but... <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I went off the air. I was the number one show on television, Larry. You were Do all, you know no. who I am? <laughs> Jewish guy, Brooklyn. Yes. Okay. 75 but, million viewers last okay. episode. What you? Don't it take like it so canceled. bad. Well, that's a, a big difference between being canceled and being number one. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll be right back. Jeez. B-movie opens... <laughs> Can we get opens. a resume in here for B me? B-Movie opens so tomorrow. Over. I, I, we'll be right back. In B-Movie, Jerry's character appears on B. Larry King's show to discuss his attempt to sue humanity, and the absurdity of the situation becomes more increased as the King character continues to attach the term B to various other phrases. Well, I want you to know that the entire bee community is supporting you in this case, which is certain to be the trial of the bee century. Thank you, Larry. 
It's at this point that Barry and B. Larry King have a fictional squabble, much like the one in the real world. Where Barry insists that the comparisons between B. Larry King and the regular Larry King are not coincidences. And this helps to illustrate a rather humorous picture of what experiencing the human world must have been like for Barry. Make no mistake, Larry King was very good humored about his role in the film, and it's obvious that he and Jerry get along quite well. And it's a very good thing that he decided to do the film after all. B. Larry King's role in B-Movie is that of a world builder and a world mocker. It helps us realize how silly it is that the world inside the hive inside B-Movie is so similar to our own, while also making that world seem a little bit more real. And for that, B. Larry King comes across as one of the most memorable bees in the entirety of the B-Movie franchise. And with that, I've been Quentin Reviews, and that's all you be. Backstreet, you'll never know if you don't go. You'll never shine if you don't glow. Hey now, you're an all- <clears throat> B-movie. <laughs> Fantastic news, everyone. As of today, we have officially surpassed 200,000 subscribers, which is pretty incredible. I mean, whoever thought that a stupid web series I started about how much I liked B-Movie would ever get as popular as it would be today? To celebrate, I thought it would be an amazing idea to look at some of the comments from my most loyal of fans. Honestly, B-Movie is what it is. A B-Movie. That's the point. It's fucking weird if you think about it too long, but it's just a weird, dry, humor-filled movie. I get what you're going for sensationalism and focusing on how strange it is by your initial description of the film, but you're making a random film seem like a... I don't know. A personal offense. Alright, alright. These are some good points. I'm sorry if I've offended you. The amount of B-Movie merchandise you earn makes me worried. What's wrong with a grown man surrounding himself with reminders of what makes life worth living? I'm 20 years old and I genuinely love the B-Movie. I watch it probably about once a year. B-Movie was the first movie I watched in theaters. Maybe that's why I am who I am. Like if the B-Movie brought you here. I like to think that B-Movie brought all of us here. I'm glad that at least one other person likes the B-Movie. Anyone else like B-Movie? Vote Ted Cruz 2020. Oh, I like the B-Movie. What was that last one? B-Movie is okay, 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 okay. Sorry, but B-Movie was genius. Oh, I couldn't agree more, Matt. It's a cinematic masterpiece. What is your profile pic? Is that like a Cylon or something? I lost my virginity while B-Movie was on in the background. Rumple my foreskin. Hey, what's up? Lowly Squatch here. Only came here to say that Maha the Bee is way better than the Bee movie, and that she is best girl, even better than Madeline as far as early, early 20th century children and waifus goes. Wow, those are all comments I wish I'd never read. Oh, I know a good question for the Bee movie. When Barry talks about the human, his parents ask if she's Jewish or Beeish. The other bees have different religions. Are there Christian bees that worship bees us? Oh, oh. Huh, that's actually a really good question that's quite interesting to answer, and to do so it's time to accelerate into our next review as we look at the lore bees inside B-Movie. One of the most memorable jokes in B-Movie comes half an hour into the future. In the scene, Barry's parents are trying to figure out why Barry has been unable to pick a job in Honey. When Barry runs off to see a friend, Barry's mother correctly presumes that he is going off to see a girl. And his mother then delivers the immortal line, I just hope she's bee-ish. This opens many questions about the cultures of bees within B-Movie. Is bee-ish, which is obviously a play on the word Jewish, meant to represent a religion that some bees in the hive seem to share? The society is closely knit and well organized, and it seems almost impossible that things like pathological debates about the existence of God could really exist within these combs. Or is bee-ish just another way to say that something is a bee? Well, it certainly gets tricky. Two minutes earlier in the film, Barry had mentioned Vanessa to Adam to a similar response. Well, well, well. Well, I met someone. You met someone? Was she bee-ish? You met someone? Was she bee-ish? Well, it's the line after this that is actually important in this case, when Adam immediately brings up another species. Well, not a wasp. Your parents will kill you. No, no, no. Spider? You know I'm not attracted to the spiders. This leads to two horrifying revelations. That bees have an active sex life despite the queen being the only one that can actually reproduce, leading to a culture of bees within this universe seeking out sex with other insects. I dated a cricket once in San Antonio. Man, those crazy legs kept me up all night. A chihuahua. And that the opposite to something being bee-ish is for them to not be a bee. If something not being bee-ish means that it's a wasp, then there are no bees that are not bee-ish, surely. 
it is worth bringing up a piece of dialogue from B-Movie the Game. Now if you didn't know, B-Movie the Game pitches itself as a candid interview with Barry set after the events of the original film. And Barry and Miss Chung reveal a crucial hint surrounding B laws. Well, the thing with humans is they have a lot, and I mean a lot, of laws. Bees only have six laws. Seven if you count no honey on Saturdays. Most bees don't. Only orthodox bees. Right. What this means is that there are indeed bees who have come to have different religious beliefs than others. Now, the term orthodox can refer to Christians, but people also tend to use the phrase orthodox Jews meaning that theoretically these orthodox bees could actually be orthodox bee-ish, making this not entirely helpful. However, there happens to be one last piece of evidence that might be wholly controversial, but it does answer half of Keck's question. In the Larry King interview, which we have formerly discussed, Barry discusses how he is not the first bee to break ranks. Bees have never been afraid to change the world. I mean, what about Bee Columbus? Bee Gandhi? Bee Jesus? This is a revolutionary declaration, meaning that numerous historical figures from humanity's history, not just those who were Jewish like B. Larry King, have also had parallels within the history of bees. Gandhi and Columbus are both hugely impactful historical figures, but obviously it is the inclusion of Bejesus here that is an interest to us. Keck might be disappointed to learn that Bezus isn't actually his name, but Bejesus having some sort of notable role in the bee community is still something to ponder. Did Bejesus do something notable? Do bees all worship Bejesus? Or just some of them? And why are not all of the historical figures mentioned in the movie beified? What in the name of mighty Hercules is this? Why Hercules? Why not be Hercules? Why not be Achilles? I mean, if it's a bee Hercules, why doesn't he have a different name? If it's regular Hercules, then why does Barry know about him? The answer is that there is no answer. We might never have an explanation for these lines about bee-ish women, or the true nature of bee Jesus, but maybe someday, Somehow, someone in the film might clarify their stances on these topics. And with that, I've been Quinn Reviews, and that's all you be. It's your game on, go play. Hey now, you're right. I've had a surprisingly high amount of people ask me to do a video discussing a very minor bee from the opening sequence of Bee Movie that I haven't touched upon. And since I had some downtime, I thought I could work through a quickie about said bee. At the start of Bee Movie, Barry B. Benson emerges from his garage, driving his bright red bee car, which he uses to pick up Adam. As they discuss their upcoming graduation, they pass a bee that yells out to Barry. Hi, Barry! Hey, Artie! Growing a mustache? Looks good! It's so interesting to me that the people making this movie would dedicate such a moment to a tiny speck of a character so insignificant that he's not even shown from the front. In fact, I think it's honestly worth wondering where the model for Artie even comes from, given that he's so barely recognizable that any other B could have been used for this gag. Whenever there's a B and B movie that's off in the distance, it's usually a reused asset. For instance, on the law of this very same shot, three bees are seen talking. And two of those bees are the Paperboy Bee and the Honey Thief Bee that we discussed a few videos ago. And the final one is actually Buzz Larvae, a one-off bee shown in the Channel 5 opening sequence. So who is Farty e I have no idea. It might be a modified Adam, although I feel like that's unlikely. All I know is that it's some model of a bee that must be used somewhere else. And sometimes, just sometimes, that's all I can be. Hey guys, it's Quentin of Quentin Reviews. I know what you guys are thinking, it's been two months now, I've uploaded maybe three actual honest videos. What's up? I think that life is a series of, of moments that are, are connected merely by themselves, and I think that it's our duty as humans to, to find a reason that we keep going through those moments, day after day, the same thing over and over again. And I think we all have thoughts that we use to justify those moments, justify the fact that we have to go through every single day and that we have to keep working. Some people believe that if they keep doing their, their crappy minimum wage job, eventually they'll be a millionaire. And some people believe in an afterlife so that when they die and they've not accomplished their dreams, they believe that they will still be rewarded for all those crappy days. And some days you get the days that you thought were going to be great, and they're, they're just the same. And when those days pass, you're at a loss for words. And you don't know if you should, if you should keep working, in case maybe some future day will make you happy, or if you should just lay down and be sad. And I guess recently I've just... I've just had trouble finding the willpower to 
to fight through those days. To keep, to keep feeling like I, I need to do all this. But I dressed my cat up like a fucking witch, and now look at the, look at that shit. Look at that shit. <laughs> Today we are going to be talking about the B movie movie appearances of Jeanette Chung, a B who at first seems unremarkable, but went on to be a defining force in the B movie expanded universe. Nine reviews ago, we spoke about Bob Bumble, an extremely minor character who appears to represent the local news station in the Hive. Well, as was mentioned in that video, Jeanette Chung is his co-host, who manages to grab the final spot in the opening sequence. The opening narrator seems to have great grand intros for every character but Chung, setting in stone some of her motivations. Either she's new to the program despite being a co-host, or she's underappreciated by those around her. When we finally see the opening segment to Hive at 5, Chung essentially only lets out her name before we suddenly cut to the B. Larry King parody, which we spoke about three videos ago. Based off of this, her role is barely one step above Storm Stinger or Buzz Larvae, although obviously Chung actually has a speaking role. In all appearances, Chung is incidentally voiced by Tress McNeil, best known for such work as Wilma Flintstone in The Flintstones in WWE, Stone Age Smackdown, Pookie in Hey Arnold, Southern Belle in Batman the Brave and the Bold, and Laura Carrot in the VeggieTales franchise. Her resume is incredible, and the fact that she has contributed to the B-movie franchise must mean so much to her. Jeanette appears one other time in the film. After a shocked Bumble reports about Barry attempting to land a plane, Jeanette and a cameraman are quickly at the scene to get the scoop where Mr. Digwater quickly begins a racist tirade about bees being in the way, particularly mocking the fact that they shouldn't even be able to fly due to the size of their wings. Barry then chimes in, delivering his now iconic black and yellow speech, which of course inspires the bees to jump into action. However, what is extremely important to note is that this is only the case because of Jeanette's insistence that they immediately go live with this story. In a way, the finale of B-Movie only happens because of Chung's quick thinking. And based off of what we see in B-Movie The Game, she is rewarded for this with quite the hefty promotion. Jeanette Chung's role in B-Movie the Movie is, in total, less than about a minute of screen time. Despite this, she is still an incredible bee, who leaves an impact on the audience while doing what's right to help the bees. But the rest of her story will have to wait. So I decided to split this video into two parts, partially because that made it easier to make, and honestly partially because I know that makes these easier to watch. Uh, so if you come back in a couple weeks, I'll have a follow-up video discussing Jeanette Chung's role in B-Movie the Game, and it's quite substantial. And with that, I know this hasn't quite been all you be, but thank you so much anyways. On or around the 17th of March, 2004, the web domain www.bmovie.com was officially registered by a then-unseen force. It wasn't until 2007 that the site was properly formatted to present the film. These days, the site is dead, and any attempt to see earlier versions proves impossible as it was apparently run on some dead version of Flash. But from various blog posts and comments from the same time, we can do our best to piece together exactly what was hosted on the website. And according to one, a very specific feature was a music video all about B-Movie. And with this comes a discussion of some of the rarest bees in all of the B-Movie franchise. We Got The Beat was a song recorded by the Go-Go's as a single in 1980. It fought its way all the way to number one, and left significant cultural impact, mainly due to its common play on MTV, a video music channel. Interestingly, Weird Al Yankovic, the most famous parody artist of all time, briefly made fun of the song in a concert-only medley only four years after this. We got the beat, and everybody get on your feet. We got the beat, got a hold of your favorite beat. We got the beat. I'm bringing this up because Weird Al Yankovic wasn't the only person to make a We Got the Beat parody simply by changing the end of the last word. We Got the Beef? Say hello to We Got the Beef. We Got The Bee is a cover slash parody of We Got The Beat, which takes the lyrics of the song and forces it to be about B-movie instead. Some of those incredible lyrics include, Look at Barry, flying all around. Getting pollen for flowers on the ground. Rolling free, just like you and me. Come on and sing along. We Got The Bee. 
We got the B. We got the B. Now some of you might wonder why I'm talking about this now instead of in May. Well that's honestly because I failed to see how I could consider this a commercial in any way. To me this just seems like some random thing that they wanted to do. Or at least I think everyone wanted to do it. But when I hear how unenthusiastically Jerry says phrases like this, black, 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 black and yellow. I start to think that maybe he was not particularly on board with this project. I mean, this is a man who infamously hates going on talk shows. He's not gonna be sold on a frickin' music video. But we are not here to just discuss a random music video. More generally, we are aiming to discuss the unique bees presented within the video. And boy oh boy, there are quite a few. So we start off with these vague shots of people on the street reacting to something. Your first intuition is that these are the faces of people watching B-Movie for the first time and not being sure why it was made. And what we're shown is something along those lines. A B-Movie B-Bus. Yes, this is real. Just as Mr. Rogers would enunciate the activity of feeding his fish, I have to directly analyze all of the insane things present on this bus. You got these huge black antennas, stripes along the side, this this weird stinger on the back, and horrible puns being projected onto the directorial board about what city the bus is going to. And then the thing stops, opens the doors, and oh god! I know a lot of you guys are thinking, Quentin, why are you so upset about, about, about a, bunch, a bunch of kids dressed up as bees? Well, that's because I'm getting fucking Vietnam flashbacks right now. You see, my high school was in a small town in Woodford County, and we used a yellow jacket for our mascot that we stole from Georgia Tech. And about four times a year, all of the students were expected to dress up in black and gold attire. There was a lot of confusion over the nature of the mascot, given that some chose to treat him like a bee. But regardless, my point is that these kids running around in black and yellow and trying to paint their spirit over everything everything that they can reminds me all too well of the preppy popular kids trying to do the same thing every single damn year. And more importantly, of the event each year where the winning class would freak out and flood the gym floor, taking everything in their way along with it. I swear it's the closest I've ever come to death. So these kids go around painting other people's cars to look like bees and basically painting the entirety of Manhattan to look like a bee. Yeah, you thought Logan Paul was disrespectful when he dressed up in a kimono and put two dead fish on a taxi? Apparently it could have been much worse. I'd rather find some free tilapia on my truck than a frickin' Wiz Khalifa paint job. Also around these clips were shown little unique animations of the characters from B-Movie dancing. And these are actually pretty neat. They're pretty well put together, and it's funny and interesting to see these iconic characters just having fun by themselves, without any real plot. Sometimes I like to play this game where uh, I pretend that I'm straight, and then I watched this clip of Jerry Seinfeld dancing. Man, I'm sure not good at this game. So why do I play it so often? The bee children in the bee bus then go and pick up the main bee himself, Jerry Seinfeld, who is hanging out at Shea Stadium. Earlier in the video there's this banner that refers to this cult as Bee Mania? So has Shea Stadium been chosen due to its relevance to the Beatles? I don't know. My point is that they switch out the balls of one of the teams practicing with balls covered in black and yellow paint. And this annoys everyone. I have no idea what this has accomplished other than just pissing off a bunch of roided out baseball players. Don't worry, I'm gonna get us out of here. So then the bee kids run off before the police can arrive and do some dances on the street. Uh, these are pretty cool, I guess. Talented kids. Then they throw buckets of paint at each other, resulting in this shot. That's rather disturbing. So they all get back on the bus and the sign changes from B. Haddon to B. Angeles, as the rearview mirror reveals that they have totally destroyed the property value of the Empire State Building by turning it into a B. Sure. After all, if turning the Empire State Building into a giant B isn't the American dream, then I don't want to be American. Which is why today, I'm giving the Empire B Building and B Haddon a 6 out of 10. Now with that, I've been quitting reviews, and that's all you be. Hey guys, so I know that I promised that within a few weeks I'd be able to put out uh, uh, Jeanette Chung Part 2, but um, to be honest, that video is going to take a lot of research. I'm going to have to really look into that more than I usually do with the B-Movie Bees. So I'm, I'm kind of trying to focus more on small projects that I can get out quickly. 
However, as I record this, it is March the 7th, so I will promise you to my best efforts I'm going to try and get the video out at the end, book end of March or the very beginning of April. This, I can't remember, is this a leaf? I can't remember why I put this on here. <laughs> there we go. Uh, this was a gift. You see, we have to wait for it to turn on so I can read the script. So today I wanted to talk about potentially one of the smallest bees in the film in terms of how much of a role they have. Uh, arguably even a smaller role than Frankie the Bee. On that note, this is one of the most notable bees in the entire film. My only problem is I'm not sure what pronouns to use for this bee, uh, which should give you a good hint about who we're talking about. Um, so I'm just going to call this bee... They. They. That's what I'm gonna do. So 40 minutes into Bee Movie, Barry follows a truck to honey farms where he discovers that bees are being used for cultivation of their honey. There are numerous bees in this scene who I honestly want to talk about in another video, but the important part is where Barry notices a bee on a wall, and when he's told that that's the queen, he remarks, That's no queen! That's a drag queen! And yeah, that's uh, that's the bit. So this is uh, the art of DreamWorks, the, the B movie. You're gonna need to expect to see this come up a lot in this series because it's a really great detailed look at the history of the B movie film and just you know the whole artistic process behind it. And uh, eventually, I want to do a video about um, bees that were going to be in B movie but ended up getting scrapped at some level of production. The important part is that this book, luckily enough, contains the actual image that is used in the film. It is on page 153, and it says right here, Apiary Man Queen Painting. And it's made by Kristen Kawamura and Tiani Han. Like Han Solo. And that's a digital piece. And that's an interesting point to bring up. Uh, in most of the times you see a picture in B-movie, it's just a 3D rendering of a single frame of a character. But in this case, uh, the, the character himself, the character herself, the character themselves, the character is, um, it's, it's actually a 2D painted illustration, which I suppose is supposed to be like a throwback to like Renaissance era royalty who would have, obviously have themselves painted. Okay, so the question at this stage is, is this joke transphobic? It seems to me that there's been this uh, steady evolution in comedy over what it is and isn't uh, acceptable in terms of making fun of trans people. In the 1980s, people just made these horrible, mean-spirited joke at the expense of trans people. And today, you're really not supposed to make fun of them at all. And it seems like the 2000s point was like a midway stage where most people hadn't really accepted the idea of a trans person yet and the comedy was slightly more respectful but still kind of on edge. But that doesn't mean this single joke has to be transphobic, but it's certainly questionable why a character uh, changing their gender needs to be seen as a representation of a corrupt uh, government. Is this a joke that we shouldn't be proud of to the extent that we shouldn't be happy that it was put in a DreamWorks movie? Is this bit so offensive now that it isn't funny anymore, when originally it might have been? Is this something that we should frown upon today? And my answer is... Seems like this is outside of my level of expertise. Yeah, I'm pretty confident that it is, actually. Yeah.
place and they say it gets colder you're bundled up now wait till you get older but a lot of people assume that i must love everything that's ever been made about b-movie and this just isn't the case i do think that some of the things that they've made have been inherently without charm case in point dreamworks b-movie the movie storybook the worst title that a book adaptation has ever been given so this is a 30 page uh, adaptation of the B-movie movie, and about half of these pages have no text, they're just illustrations. So, so it's like someone took this huge, uh, theatrically released, cinematically linked movie, and they made it into 15 pages, and that's being generous, because let's be real, any page that has text has, like, a paragraph. So this is basically B-movie retold as, like, uh, one or two pages on a Google Doc. Oh, and before we start reading this, this video is actually sponsored by Audacity. Okay, it's not really, it's a free program, they don't sponsor people, but I just wanted to... I use their... I use Audacity a lot, and I feel like... I feel like people don't appreciate it, so I just wanted to give it, like, a shout-out. Uh, so yeah, um, download Audacity. It's a, it's a great little app. The first thing that I noticed when I picked this up was, uh, I was, of course, glancing around the front and the back. There's this little thing in the bottom that says, very approved, and a quote which reads, I got no problem with this. And I like that because it's less like he's advocating or sponsoring the book, and more like he's saying that he's not actively offended by it. Like, like, oh, this isn't good, but I'm not, like, mad that they made it. This book was adapted by Susan Corman, who is best known for other books also on Amazon, such as Overexposed and Why Did My Ice Pop Melt? It has pencils, pencils by Artful Doodlers and... Marcelo Matir, and Digital Paints by Dave McCaig. McCaig, yeah, you'd think it would be McCraig, but it's McCaig. Now, I don't know who's to blame for some of the horrible, horrifyingly bad art in this book. Um, it's probably Dave, but I want to stop and say, uh, uh, no matter what, no matter how upset this video might make you when I'm flipping through this book, uh, don't go after these people or harass them online. I've seen a lot of that in the DreamWorks community, and frankly, it's it's kind of gross, and, and I really can't support it. So the book, so the book just goes through most of the notable scenes in the movie one page at a time. You know, so you got him graduating uh, right there, and then he goes straight to find out about the jobs that they're going to do. Uh, they tour Hunix Industries. They learn about how things work. They can you know do any job they want, but they get one job for the rest of their life. You know, it's standard. It's like a it's like a a little chunked out version of that scene. Here's what bothers me. Uh, the art on this page, specifically of of the bees, of Barry and Adam. Oh, it's bad. Oh, it's horrifying. Look at that. That's not good at all. Like, like Jesus Christ. I hate to bring this up, but the art in this book looks like It goes on, you know, he does the, he does the whole thing where he's, he's going to Central Park. That's cute. Then he meets Vanessa, you know. Pretty standard B-movie continuity. And then, you know, Barry and Vanessa start talking, and again, the art is horrifying. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that right there. Look at that. Look at it. What the fuck? You know, she's not too better. This doesn't look like real art. Again, this looks like a weird porn knockoff. Yeah, but then, you know, you know, Honey finds out Honey's real. Blah, blah, blah. You know, people get gassed. Here's an interesting little adaption note. In this book, it looks, in this book, it looks like the bees are like enjoying being gassed. This page in particular, where they're, you know, you know, we all know this scene for a bee movie, but this scene is weird for me, because I don't know how to put this. Well, I guess I do. Vanessa looks like she's like a character in Final Fantasy VII Advent Children. Look at that little, little Tifa Lockhart. I'm really surprised that the meme crowd hasn't found this book. Like, look at this. Look at that. Yeah, so all the flowers die, and then, uh, there's a P, and then, uh, then there's a plane. <laughs> I love that. This book is so quickly paced. It's just like, um, they steal the float, and, uh-oh, they're flying a plane. I don't know how that happened. Skip, like, 20 minutes of the movie. And uh, then all the bees are fine. They're all happy. And that's it. <laughs> I think that Seinfeld's comedic talents really stand out in uh, relaxed, 
simplified situations where characters can just interact. And when you take those scenes and try and describe them in like five words, uh, this is the book that you get. And like, I would love to see someone who has never seen B-Movie, like, like read this book. And I would love for them to then to be told like, oh no, it's actually a really accurate adaptation. All these plot points are actually in the movie. Because I don't think they would believe that. Anyways, we talked about this book. We talked about the bees in this book. And so, I guess, uh, that's all you be. Well guys, it's April the 1st, and you know what that means! Every YouTuber on the planet is going to try and make fictitious meme videos to try and subvert your expectations, which isn't going to work because you're expecting your expectations to be subverted. Now some of you might have expected that I wouldn't be able to come up with anything legitimate to do for this video, like the Christmas review. However, I, I actually had a really great idea. I want to talk about B-movie bees that are unofficial, not knockoffs but parodies. B parodies from parodies of B-movie. So I was actually able to find two B-movie parodies in mainstream media. I'm sure there's more, but because no one's ever tried to create a category of B-movie parodies, it's sort of hard to find them all. So let's talk about BoJack Horseman. BoJack Horseman is a Netflix original series that explores the psyche of a once world-famous sitcom star. The series is based in a world where half of the population are anthropomorphic animal people, and half of the population are real humans. And we follow a series of humans and animal people who take part in the entertainment industry. In Season 3 Episode 2, we flash back nine years to the story of Bojack's failed follow-up sitcom. The entire episode is thus set in 2007, and in one scene a visual gag is pulled off where we see a human spider creature dressed up as Spider-Man preparing to work on Spider-Man 3 in the background of a sequence where Jerry Seinfeld dressed up as his B-movie character is trying to impress a real bee on set. Buzz, buzz, buzz! Buzz, buzz, buzz! You heard what the network said. I heard the It's little immersive Easter eggs like this which make BoJack Horseman one of the greatest animated series in the last decade. It's more than just a visual gag, it makes you think. So in this universe where anthropomorphic human-animal hybrids exist, a movie set in a world where anthropomorphic human hybrids exists also was made? And I guess in that world, Jerry Seinfeld's performance would sort of be like, be blackface? Is Jerry Seinfeld the only human playing a bee in this movie? Are all the other bees played by real bees, but he's been given the lead role because he's just such a star? And does he only make bee noises in this version of the film? If you haven't watched BoJack Horseman, I can't recommend it enough. Turn this video off right now and go watch it instead. And with that, let's talk about MAD. MAD is, of course, a magazine dedicated to covering and satirizing popular culture. There have been two main attempts to bring it to the small screen. First with a live-action sketch comedy show that lasted from 1995 to 2009, and then with a Cartoon Network child-oriented series which aired in the early 2010s. Let's just talk about the second series. The 20th episode of Season 1 of MAD is titled co -B Movie slash Law and Ogre. As you might imagine, it includes one of the longest and most successful mainstream B-movie parodies of all time. The skit starts off with Kobe playing basketball within his hive, where he's become known as the best of the best. Buzz passes to Hiverson. Hiverson to B-Banks. Back to Hiverson. The clock is ticking on the number of B-puns we can make. But as Kobe ventures out into the real world, he finds out that there's already a Kobe playing basketball there. He briefly gives up before being picked up and adopted by the mom from the blind side. You're changing that B's life. No, yeah, Wing. He's changing mine. 
After he makes her a lot of money, he becomes inspired to challenge the real Kobe to a basketball match. I absolutely adore the unique style of using the real actors' heads on top of these animated bee bodies. It's funny how you can still come to recognize Barry as Barry and Adam as Adam, even when they have the faces of their respective actors. It gives a really fun feel to the skit and brings the world to life. So Kobe and Kobe go head to head, where there is a quick parody of the tennis scene. But Kobe wins and is recognized as a real basketball player. I'm signing Kobe here to a five year contract. Woohoo! Too bad my life cycle's only six weeks. You know, you're right. This was a much better movie. Given that I view B Movie as a very eccentric franchise to be invested in, like I am, it's always funny to see it referenced in other media, be that new media or mainstream work. And it's even more fun to see unique bees be born out of these productions. Thanks for watching guys, sorry that Jeanette Chung Part 2 isn't out yet, I'm working really hard on it and I promise you it is going to be the next video that comes out. Although that might mean that I'm going to have to take a couple weeks off to really focus on it. Thanks for watching! Is the camera still running? Why would I do this? I don't. I don't know why I always do this. <laughs> oh, this is Monopoly, and this is Monopoly on drugs. Any questions? Welcome to the Quinn Reviews YouTube channel. I know that in the last video I claimed I'd have to take a couple weeks off to work on this big video. Um, I'm actually recording this April the fourth. April the fourth. So uh, I should be able to get this out pretty quick, and uh, additionally, I'll probably be able to finish a couple other videos before April ends. And then after that, you got Monetized May, and that's a whole other shark. Back in March, we discussed the B-movie movie appearances of Jeanette Chung. And today, as promised, we're going to be discussing her role in the B-movie expanded universe. So in the first 10 years of the 21st century, it was very common to see regular theatrically released movies also be published as games. The logic here was simple. Kids would see the movies in the theater, and the game would allow for them to relive the same experience as they waited for the original product to be released on home video. Notable examples of this include the Harry Potter games, the Over the Hedge game, which I actually reviewed back in 2013, and of course, Aragon the game. It's my ultimate suspicion that Jerry Seinfeld was just as involved in the creation of B-Movie the Game as he was B-Movie the Movie. The reason is that it's a lot more unique and complex than you would usually expect from these sorts of games. To put it short, B-Movie the Game is essentially a sequel to B-Movie the Movie. The entire game is framed as an interview being conducted by today's B, Jeanette Chung. And as we've discussed before, in the first film she has numerous lines which set up her role in this game. This piece of continuity is somewhat fascinating. Personally, I wouldn't be shocked if it turned out that Chung was only in the movie to set up her role in the game, as that would almost make more sense than things being done the other way around. Jerry Seinfeld is a man who thinks ahead. He's a systematic genius, and this seems like something he would have planned from the start. The interview is processed through a series of unique methods. At some points, interviews with other B-movie characters will be shown to tie into Barry's reaction. This includes a hilarious cut-in with Ken. Looks so fabulous! Get away from me, you jackals! Go away! Don't make me go Pompeii on your keysters! And a very awkward appearance by Adam, who still seems to be very self-conscious about his new stinger. The interview also, of course, serves as a segue into the actual gameplay, which is explained in a very unique way in narrative. It's somewhat implied that all of the scenes of the game are actually performed out recreations, but if you stop to think about it too long, it doesn't really make any sense. For instance, why are the humans also taking part in the recreations if they hate bees? It just doesn't really make sense. But notably, this is also used to reveal sort of deleted plot lines from the original Bee movie. For instance, there is an additional storyline about the corrupt lawyer from the original film trying to plot a secret conspiracy behind the scenes of the trial, and Barry having to stop him. Theoretically, you could very potentially take these scenes and insert them back into B-Movie the Movie to create a slightly longer edit. After Barry's very own family are shown as guests, he makes a very strange comment which I find very interesting. You don't have any friends, do you? Not a one. This notably seems to confirm the theory that I posed in the first part of my review of Jeanette Chung, that she's risen through the ranks without really making any allies. The character of Jeanette Chung herself slowly becomes more twisted as the game goes on. At the start, she's very flashy and bold, as you might expect in a news reporter to be. Could it happen again? The answer might shock you. But throughout, she slowly reveals herself to be egotistical, fame-hungry, and overall quite vicious. During the most shocking sequence, 
we fade up on her choking out one of her own employees over the failure to properly sweeten her coffee. Wow. Just wow. I want to stop to give a big shout out to Wishing to Kai, which is the YouTube channel which has graciously uploaded the footage that I've been using in this video. She has been an incredibly important part of piecing together the story of B-Movie, and I'm very disappointed to find out that she only has 200,000 subscribers. She honestly deserves like a good hundred more, so, so go check her out. Overall, just like any interview with a notable or famous person, this narrative is very important because it gives us a window into the mind of Barry Benson. I actually came out of this game feeling much more knowledgeable about the nature of the Hive and Bee movie because the questions really dive that deep. I pulled quotes from this game in the past and honestly, I'm likely to do it in the future. And because of that, I give Jeanette Chung a 6 out of 10. With that, I've been Quinn Reviews, and that's all you- God damn it, Caleb, what do you want? Why do you always interrupt me with this crap? I've come to tell you about the amazing new deals from- Shut up, just shut up! You think you know more than me? You, you think you know anything that I don't? You think I don't know about this crap? How dare you talk to me like that? How dare you? And I see that gun you're hiding. Don't even think about it, we both know you don't have the nerve. You know what? I'm gonna have to talk to you guys next time, because I gotta take care of something. Satellite picture. You guys remember about ten reviews ago when I said that that, that I felt more passionate about talking about B-Movie than ever before, and that it was like my love for B-Movie was feeding back into itself into some sort of centrifugal loop. Well, I feel that way again today. So I wanted to sit down with you guys and do a topic which I have wanted to discuss for the longest time, and that is bees that were unused in B-Movie. Yes, as B-Movie was made, numerous designers created bees which just didn't make the cut, which is why today we are going to be discussing the top 10 bees from B-Movie which were not used in B-Movie the film. Starting off, let us again revisit The Art of B-Movie by... Jerry Beck. It took the people in charge of Bee Movie so long to come up with a finalized design for Barry and the Bees that even by the time they were starting to do storyboards, they didn't have a design. And because of this, there are numerous bees that were created during about a 10 month period that did not end up in the film because for, for the most part, most of these designs weren't even really considered seriously for the movie. Let's start off with number 10, The Hooters Bee by Craig Kelman. Kelman created a series of designs which can only be described as hyper-sexualized bees, and one of them was a Hooters waitress with a shirt that reads, Honeys, you'll love our wings. Interestingly, these set of sketches have the characters drawn with four arms instead of two. Oh fuck, I'm getting really good at cracking my back. Then heading right off to number eight where we have a bee with a pet fly by Christophe Lorette, or something like that. I think that B-Movie is surprisingly lacking in visual easter egg gags. Ten videos ago we talked about the gas guzzler bee, but there aren't really a lot of moments in the film like that, and I think just a, a brief sight gag, like someone having a fly as a pet in the early part of the movie, would have done a great deal to increase the quality of that part. And at number seven we have a set of somewhat childlike bees designed by... Bill Mayer? That's gotta be a different Bill Mayer, right? Anyways, these are interesting because they remind me of something out of Arthur or Franklin. They really don't fit the final style in any way whatsoever. Then at number six, you've got the Crash Test Bee by Michael Isaac. By the looks of it, he was replaced by Dave, the Stress Test Bee. And for the next couple of the list, we're going to be looking at a huge grouping of bees by Carlos Grandel. Starting off with number five, the Tourist Bees. Number four, the Baby Bee and the Baby Sitter Bee. Number three, the Musician Bees. And of course, number two, the Santa Claus Bee. And for number one, well, let's discuss that in the next video. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Jerry Seinfeld. Goodbye. What the fuck am I doing with my life? Guys, we skate is getting pretty thin. Hey, bitches, I'm back. With my Garfield cup.
So last time I said that I wanted to push the final unused B from B movie to a separate video, and I think you'll find that that separation was entirely justified. The Queen Bee was one of the bees which Jerry Seinfeld and his crew were the most proud of, but sadly, it never saw the light of day. Or did it? Today, we're going to be talking about this very mysterious bee, where she can be found in behind-the-scenes material, and where she actually ended up in the Bee Movie franchise. The Bean Queen can be found in her own separate section in the Bee Movie art book, written by Jerry Beck. She is one of the few characters to have her own set of pages, which is very notable considering that she's not actually in the movie. The character's design is honestly so incredibly gorgeous that it almost seems like something that would belong in a Pixar or Disney film. On these pages, we get two quotes. The first, from visual development artist Michael Isaac, reads, We wanted a floral influence, but we also wanted the Queen's Palace to share the visual language of the beehive. A clean shape, something sophisticated and romantic. We decided something where it would actually be a rose from one point of view. I thought that if Barry dropped into the top of these petals, they would open, let him in, then close. Christoph, not gonna say that last name, follows up on this by saying, The Queen Bee didn't change much from day one. She ended up being a really pretty bee. She had long legs and a long abdomen, like a real Queen Bee. Now she's not even in the movie. In terms of the actual scripted out scene, how she was to appear in the movie, that can be found under deleted sequences on the B-Movie DVD. In this animatic, Barry gets shoved into the nest of his queen, where she briefly tries to seduce him before realizing that he's actually the one who broke the bee laws, at which point she tries to kill him. However, she eventually concedes this attempt when Barry says that a lawsuit to reclaim their honey could guarantee her re-election. But they'll want me, why wouldn't they want me? I'll win easily, don't you think? Well, there's no way to tell. By how much? What? How much will I win by? I don't know! As he runs off into the second act of the film, he stops the nearby Spanish fly. She is a bit dingy, isn't she? You can't comprehend. <sighs> but despite this very promising automatic, that sequence is never seen in the film. Why? Well, I suspect that the numerous extremely expensive sequences in the film probably led them to try and cut anything superfluous. Super... Superfu... Su... 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 su well, I suspect that the numerous complex sequences in the film caused them to cut anything that wasn't completely necessary to the continuous plot. And sadly, the Queen Bee, while really interesting and really cool, was mainly intended for a one-off scene that has no bearing on the rest of the story. And the scene itself would have featured numerous, unique character models and a very complex set that would have served no purpose outside of that. However, we can still definitively say that this scene is canon. How do I know that, you might ask? Well, consult with the B-Movie video game, which we talked about only a few videos ago. During his interview, Barry discusses with Chung in detail the scene which was cut, and additionally describes to her the Queen Bee. Barry, you discovered the humans were stealing our honey, and you were brought before the Queen. Tell me, was she beautiful? Um, I guess. I was commanded to bow a lot, so I didn't really get a good look. I've always felt that if the Queen and I were ever able to meet socially, we would become the best of friends. Uh, sure, why not? So you'll introduce me? I, I, I'm not sure I'd really feel comfortable. I mean, I don't really know her. We only met because I'd broken a B law. It's not like, you know, we had tea. It was more of a sit in judgment of me kind of thing. The threat of execution was somewhat in the air. So you're saying no? Um, okay, so anyway. So there we are, the B movie Queen B. One of the most interesting things to be created for the B-Movie B Pantheon, but sadly left on the editing room floor. If there's any one thing I want you to take away from this video, it's that... I love B-Movie more... than anything else in my life, and... That's uh, been tricky with a lot of my relationships with friends and family and lovers. But I think it's been worth it. Water's getting warm, so you might as well swim. My world's on fire, how about yours? It's really interesting how when you know enough about B-Movie, something that seems simple on a surface level 
when then closely analyzed, is actually really interesting. Case in point, the tour guide bee that Barry meets at the start of B-Movie. The character named Trudy in the novelization isn't that interesting in the film. She greets our main characters directly after Boswell ends the graduation ceremony, and is clearly putting on a face to sell the hive to the audience before her. And you'll be happy to know that bees as a species haven't had one day off in 27 million years. Ooh. So you'll just work us to death? We'll sure try. <laughs> <laughs> now having grown up watching Bee Movie a lot, but never really understanding the history behind it, I never really thought that this bee was interesting to talk about. But that changed when I started diving into the promotional work that was released for Bee Movie when it was starting to be animated. Um, he knows what he's like and doesn't like, but he's, but he's asked a big question. And he... So you'll just work Work us to death? We'll try! <laughs> Did you see that? That right there was Dean Buswell being featured in the same scene that we know Trudy for doing in the final cut. At some stage, early into the animation of B-Movie, Trudy did not exist, and instead, Buswell took her role. Adding to the joke where Buswell does several jobs in the hive, and in fact making it much more clear to people watching it for the first time. So what happened? What got Buswell replaced, and why does Trudy exist? The answer, from my research, apparently comes from our previous discussion, that of the Queen Bee. When the Queen Bee was scrapped from Bee Movie, Jerry Seinfeld felt bad that her very talented voice actor was not going to have a featuring role in this cinematic masterpiece. To make up for this, he changed one of the Buzzwell scenes to instead focus on a new character. With that, Trudy came to be. I did not do any research. Can you imagine? Yeah, yeah, I did research. I went to like a beekeeping farm Woo. and li lived there for six weeks in preparation. This is so fascinating to me. Something that always seemed just normal about Bee Movie now comes across like a scar scraped across the belly of the first act. A direct representation of the historical context behind the movie. Sure, Trudy still isn't that interesting of a bee, but the history behind her makes her very notable and it would be a big sin not to talk about her. And, uh, I had like six more pages of Trudy analysis, but I just realized this room is on fire, so I need to immediately evacuate the premises and call a fire department. Luckily, I don't really have that much valuable stuff down here. Oh, see you guys next time. Hey guys, good news. So, uh... A uh, fire department came over, and, uh, <laughs> they took care of it. Uh, Caleb caught on fire. Uh, I wanted to take him to the hospital, but, uh, uh, it's kind of a secret that he lives here. Uh, none of his family knows or anything, so I couldn't do that. Anyways, I bought a bunch of aloe vera oil. Just rubbed that on him. Uh, so he should be fine. Basically, the recap is, downstairs is trashed, can't film down there anymore. I don't know, I'm gonna try and look into what I can do about that. In the meanwhile, I'm just gonna film upstairs, uh, in my bedroom. As you can see, I'm getting ready to go to bed, so I thought I'd shoot a quickie. It's currently April the 29th, which means next comes May content. I figured I'd film that right in front of this door. And, uh, I'm excited to, to work that out for you. Caleb's staying in the closet. I mean, the physical closet. I put him in the closet. He's not, he's not gay. I put him in, uh, the closet in my bedroom. Anyway, since I'm trying to just quickly, uh, wrap up my work, I thought I'd just, you know, I'm gonna put my, my bedtime hat on. Oh, this is tight. I should cut a hole in this or something. Uh, I thought I'd just do a quickie, you know, uh, as you do. Uh, I mean, I have, like, a list of bees that I can review. Um, this is off the cuff. What bee should I review really quick, quickly right before May starts? Oh, the hell with it. I know what we'll do. Let's talk about the cameraman bee in the scene where, uh, Jeanette Chung is interviewing the uh, racist human, and the human goes on a rant about bees, and then Barry gives his uh, his speech. In that scene, Jeanette Chung is with a cameraman bee, and that bee has a tiny little camera, and that's adorable. Can we get a round of applause for cameraman bee? I'll also use that as the clap sync. Cameraman bee's great. I mean, what, what bad thing does you have to say about cameraman bee? He, like, she says, put this on the air, and he does that. I don't know how he does that, he just has a camera, but somehow he controls the wavelengths. Check out this skull behind me. Yeah. Let's put up with masking tape. I like Cameraman B, and, uh, I think that's his one appearance, the scene with Jeanette Chung, but Cameraman B is dope. Cameraman B is a, is a, is a 10 out of 8. A 10 out of 2. He is a, a 5,000, what a good cameraman and a good B. Alright, thanks for watching. Looking forward to seeing what I can bring you guys. In May, I'm going to bed. <laughs> okay, well that's it. That's all. It's all you be. Get your game on, go play. Hey now, you're
All right, Bum Bum, we're gonna start recording. I just need you to, you know, clamp her down a little. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Monetized May. Uh, ignore all this wallpaper I'm putting up. I'm, uh, I'm trying. I'm just, I'm just trying it out. See how the colors work. I, honestly, so far, like, I, I don't really like it. I might take these down immediately. But, uh, you know, this is just a test. I want to see how it looks on video. Jan was a major, so always feels so unhappy unless they got a war. Generals and majors, uh huh, are never too far from something, something in the shade. Bonbon, bon, you want out? All right, you just sit there. This one's going on the wall. I, <laughs> I love that one. Remember, kids, you're not a cuck if the other guy is also you. For those of you who are new to the channel, for the entire month of May, I review bees from commercials meant for B movie. This way, we can touch upon some obscure bees from the B movie franchise. And to fit that theme, today's episode is actually sponsored by Bee Monkey. Bee Monkey in a cup for coffee. Bee Monkey go to job. Bee Monkey have boring meeting. With boring manager Rob. So today's ad is so rare, I actually couldn't find that much information about it, but it's pretty obviously real, so let's talk about it. In America, we're used to very particular ads about McDonald's being aired. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Okay. Yo. Purple. Very, very powerful. But from what I've learned, it's very common for overseas McDonald's franchises to seek out their own very unique advertisements. Some fun, some food, it's all inside this Happy Meal. Some fun, some food, it's all inside this Happy Meal. Some fun, some food, it's all inside this Happy Meal. Some fun, some food, it's all inside this Donkey! Donkey. This is why a company ironically named Hornet Incorporated is often tasked with creating stop motion or 3D McDonald's ads which don't appear in the States. This obviously has included B-movie ads, specifically two B-movie ads, which very much break the standard for what we expect. Inside one of the flowers is illustrated a tiny bee bar, and it's amazing how much detail they put into this one shot. There's a bee waitress with a cute top, and some bee patrons, and I just find it so satisfying how, how the cup sort of glides over when she throws it across the counter. But evidently, the flower is tickled by a butterfly and sneezes out the entire bar. Better start rebuilding. Ooh, Bonbon. Oh, goodness. Bonbon, no. no. That's that's Bee Monkey. Leave Bee Monkey alone, Bonbon. You're gonna break the cup, for God's sakes. Oh, Jesus, right? In the next commercial, we meet this sentient hive thing that starts telling us bees are essential for many fruits in terms of growth. Bees then fly in and out of the hive and into the tree surrounding it, and suddenly huge heaps of fruit grow from that tree. Then this fucker flies in. Hi, I'm Brian! Hey Brian, what's up man? What's uh, what you- what, what's up? I don't peck the tree man, he's sentient, that's a dick move. These little commercials interest me a lot. They're, they're easily something that most people would skip over and just ignore. But you can tell that a lot of passion and talent went into creating the bees that are inside this B-movie commercial. For a commercial aimed at B-movie at McDonald's, you would expect them to glance over the quality. Yet you can tell that the bees in this commercial had nothing but love when they were nurtured into existence. And that's exactly why Monetized May is so exciting to me. Because I get to talk about all these bees that are, that are so interesting and stuff full of love that, that most people would ignore. Because the fact that people just ignore Hornet Inc. and how much work they put into these just because they're overseas and because it's a McDonald's commercial, it's honestly the saddest thing I've ever thought about. Oh, Jesus Christ, that's not right. That's better, okay. I mean, don't act surprised. I told you it was just like a test. I, I said I was going to take it down like immediately. Last time on Monetized May, ladies and gentlemen, we discussed a series of foreign B-movie McDonald's commercials. And this time we are going to be following up by discussing a series of American McDonald's commercials. Two different commercials, different in one simple way. That being that in my personal opinion, one of these is canon and one of these is not. The first features Barry and the rest of the pollen jocks detecting what they believe to be daisies, only to land and realize that they have in fact landed on a massive McDonald's sign. 
This is a little ridiculous, given that in New York these signs are known to be much smaller than this due to various rules. But let's just say that after the first film, Barry travels the world a bit. Or maybe New York in this universe is different. I mean, the bees get civil rights, everything is up in the air. When he lands, he points out that this isn't a flower, but it smells very good. Then he notes a bunch of kids playing with B-movie toys, and after that, it's just kind of a regular commercial. At the end, Barry and the jocks fly away. Barry noting that next time, he'll use the fly-through. It is hot in here. I find this commercial to be... feasible. I mean, obviously, it's set after the end of B-movie when Barry becomes an actual pollen jack. I mean, jock. But otherwise, it seems pretty consistent with the film. Obviously, them detecting the McDonald's logo is a throwback to the whole tennis scene. So I'd like to think of this one as canon. The next one, however, is questionable. In this one, we hear a voiceover of Barry explaining that some days, things just don't seem to go right. This is illustrated through various clips from the actual theatrically released original B-movie. At the end, Barry contests that at the very least, there will always be breakfast. This is bookended by him approaching a McDonald's, where he makes true on his promise to use the drive through Now this is the one that I find to be a bit iffy. You see, I find the idea of a minimum wage job existing within the Hive to be questionable for the exact same reasons that I didn't believe that religion existed within the Hive, or at least religious dichotomy. It's just hard to imagine a society which is so perfect that you can walk into traffic and just stand there also doing something as frankly malicious as minimum wage McDonald's employment. And even the idea that McDonald's exists within the Hive is extremely questionable. However, upon thinking about this, I only view it this way because I'm presuming that this takes place early on in the film, because obviously these clips are taken from early on in the film. In this is always breakfast. Nothing makes more- But because we never see Adam from the waist down, we can postulate that this actually takes place after the end of the movie, and thus after the human bee merger that takes place during the final act. And in this case, it certainly makes sense that McDonald's would go out of their way to put their own restaurants inside beehives, because I frankly think that is the next step in, an, in a frankly highly evolving Western society. But it's important that we stop and say this. I know as a B-movie fan that this is a little bit silly and it's a little bit camp, and I just want you guys to know that it's nothing that should be taken too seriously. Come here, Bob. Oh. <laughs> I know. But I'm doing it because I love you. <laughs> That's all you be. Show on, get paid. The B-movie commercial entity of live-action Jerry Seinfeld is so widely known and discussed that it might seem not worthy of actually talking about in a standalone video. But I put it to you that there are a lot of obscure details that you actually didn't know about live-action B. Jerry Seinfeld. To cut to the chase, one of the very first things released to advertise the B-movie movie was a series of live-action commercials which painted the film to be, well, live-action. Oh, it's mad at me after that. The commercials portray the live-action film to be a mess, and at the end they decide to make an animated film instead. At the core of these commercials is, of course, Jerry Seinfeld playing a live-action bee in a ridiculous costume. Buzz, 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 buzz. I know what I'll do. I'll pollinate these flowers. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Most people either love these commercials because they're ridiculous and represent a lot of the tone of the film, or they hate them because they're stupid and represent that to some, the movie is stupid and not worthy of discussion. But what most people don't know, and what is not discussed, is that live-action Jerry Seinfeld actually extends far past the reaches of these two commercials. The very first thing we need to bring up when discussing this topic is the B-Movie TV Juniors, which can be found on the Very Jerry 2-disc edition of B-Movie, which I, I think I have somewhere, but I don't know where it is right now. These skits essentially mock the production of B-Movie, why B-Movie was made, 
and even the nature of animation itself during that era. The most notable skit in this discussion comes when Jerry Seinfeld can be seen yelling at the crew of the film that he wants to, quote, be a bee. I don't feel like anybody in this room is focused on this thing but me. I want to be a bee! Now, given that this segment was made during the production of the film, this is almost certainly the origins of the Jerry Seinfeld live-action B running gag. But to me, the most fascinating use of the Jerry Seinfeld live-action B running gag slash character came not in a commercial, but in a publicity stunt, where Jerry Seinfeld at some point decided to arrive at an event advertising B-movie dressed in his B-movie costume swinging down on a zip line. You know, a lot of people just go on talk shows and tell jokes. Now you tell me. I missed him. Could you do that again? <laughs> that is so strange, so spectacular, and so Jerry. Today's episode is brought to you by our proud sponsor, AbeVagoda.com. This is a website dedicated entirely to keeping track of if Abe Vagoda is dead or not. Right now, according to the site, he is dead. But this site's been keeping us up to date from day one, and I'm going to continue to check it every single day. Check him out and expect to hear about him one or two more times in the future. So until you hear from me again, I've been quitting reviews, and that's all you be. Hello and welcome back to our entire month of bees from B-Movie commercials. And today I want to talk to you about one of the darkest pages in B-Movie history. Something so gruesome that I honestly advise some of you look away. Last week we spoke very briefly on the topic of B-Movie TV Juniors, a series of sarcastic parody behind the scene videos exploring the supposed production of the film, included on the Very Jerry 2 disc edition of B-Movie. Now I noticed last week some of you were very confused upon why I went on such a huge tangent about these specials, and the answer is that, believe it or not, the B-Movie TV Juniors actually aired on real television. They were all, in a sense, real advertisements used to try and get people to see B-Movie. They aired so often that some people say that the TV Juniors were the exact reason why most people were burnt out on B-Movie before it even came out, because the ads just played that often. Now, because these TV Juniors were actually intended to entice adult audiences and not children, they could be slightly more dark than most of the other advertisements, or really anything ever made for B-Movie. Which is what brings us to this particular B-Movie product. A TV Juniors advertisement that features real, actual, dead bees. Once again, I really must insist, viewer discretion is advised. The segment, entitled Snack Snack Patty Whack, is a direct satire of food companies attempting to acquire animated films as sponsorships, just as many attempted with B-Movie. I mean, we not only have talked about B-Movie honey containers, but of course there was B-Movie McDonald's, there was B-Movie cereal boxes, and allegedly there was plans to do B-Movie candy corn, but I haven't seen any evidence that that went into production. We start off with this sort of surreal introduction segment, which was obviously filmed much later on a much better camera. Here I am, meeting with some high-level snack executives. Like many TV juniors, the plot afterwards revolves around Jerry meeting with executives to try and make plans for his film. Thank you for meeting with us. We love the movie. It is then that the executives try to pitch the food which they have designed for B-Movie, and I am going to do my best to censor this as much as I can. They're all in there. What's in there? Bees. Yes, there are dead bees in the candy. That is the reveal. We have sugar-dusted bees, which are just as sweet as the sugar-coated bees, but you get a better look at the bees' anatomy. Okay, I hadn't really thought of that. Both of the executives take bites out of different kinds of bee candy, and it's implied that one of them finds it secretly very disgusting. Now, Jerry initially reacts to this in a very human way, simply being disgusted by such a large amount of dead bees. There's a corpse of a dead animal in there. Well, we wouldn't use those words, but in short, yeah. Who would want that? Who wouldn't? But eventually, he does give in to pressure and tries some of the candy bees. I might as well try it. 
It is then that the executives mention that they have gone out of their way to remove all stingers, which is quickly proven to be false after Jerry begins to bleed from the mouth. The executives quickly flee, one quickly dashing back in to grab another handful of bee candy. It's quite shocking to see something like this come out of a franchise about talking bees. And while we can all very quickly laugh, it's also very easy to be disturbed. And I think it's clear that in that little segment, Jerry Seinfeld got much more than he ever beaded. And I'm willing to say that I did too. Thank you. I'm not really feeling too hot today. Can we just do like a really short version of the intro and get into this? Jerome Allen Seinfeld, born April 29th, 1954, a comedic genius, a modern Walt Disney, the creator of some of the greatest pieces of pop culture to ever exist, as well as the greatest franchise of all time, the B movie franchise. This man, this genius, this brain inside a skeleton, inside a sack of skin, this is one of the most important men on the planet Earth. The person behind most of my life and the decisions I make on a day-to-day -day basis. Although honestly, I'm a bit more of a Norm MacDonald fan. The B-Movie TV Juniors, which we have talked about in the past few videos, are fascinating partially because of how aptly they predict the future of how the film would be perceived. As an example, the numerous skits mocking the existence of blank movie movies seems to foreshadow the existence of things like the Emoji Movie and the Lego Movie. How about, like, do on a lawn? You know, the, the story has to happen in the morning right. because the dew evaporates. They're talking about making a movie about water droplets. You gotta get me out of this place. But the most uncanny segment is one where Jerry Seinfeld predicts the existence of B-movie knockoffs. This is illustrated through a segment where he goes into the streets and actually finds an example. In the middle of this B-movie TV Juniors commercial, a fake Spanish sitcom called B-movie is played. And... I just think this segment is hilarious, honestly. It's a good joke, and these bees are fascinating because they are Seinfeld's interpretation of how other people would interpret his own work. I thought about trying to figure out who all these actors are, and even trying to get this segment translated. But honestly, I just... I just couldn't get around to it. Guys, we're getting to the end of May here, and I just feel so burnt out. I've just done so many videos during the past two months, and specifically so many videos recently about B-movie commercials, that I need to get away. I need to find an escape. A break. Or else, this emptiness inside me is never going to fade away. Caleb, hey buddy, uh... Going to New York, here's some food. See you in a week. So it's, um, it's June the 5th, 2018, and I'm in Brooklyn. I'm in Brooklyn, New York, and I have an Airbnb here, which is very nice. It's a, ni it's a nice place, you know. They've got a spare bed propped against the wall in case I need another one. I keep I keep wondering if there's like a reason that this is is this hiding something, you know? But um yeah, I'm in Brooklyn and uh I'm I'm my just cuz my hotel is here, my Airbnb is here. But um and I've been going into New York. Last month, of course, was Monetized May, and I released a lot of videos that month. Like a crazy amount of videos. And so I just kind of needed a break. I needed a little break. And so I thought I'd come to New York. The B-movie capital. Um, 
and just chill out while also recording some uh, some footage for a potential video. So here's some. Uh, basically, this is going to be some. Uh, this is going to be some of me exploring New York. Exploring New York. Um, uh, but mainly the B movie bits. about 4 a.m. I love flying out early. I didn't sleep last night, but you know, because I had to be up this early and I had work to do. But I love flying early. And the reason is that, um, you can tell just a little eccentric, I guess. Just so nice to have a nice little empty space. Again, we should begin boarding in about 15 minutes. If you have any questions about today's flight, please feel free to see me here prior to the beginning of boarding. Thank you. You know how no one's been talking for like three minutes, and you've just patiently been sitting there waiting for the good part? Now imagine that, but eight hours. And now you too have flown Delta. I arrived in New York at the start of June and was greeted by an old friend from high school, Austin Horn. Austin had gone out of his way to make sure I felt comfortable in Manhattan, although I was pretty constantly confused as to why he was still in the state, given that his classes had wrapped up the month before. Nevertheless, Austin made sure that I felt welcome and took me out for some authentic New York pizza. That's holy. I want to see. I want to see some real enjoyment of the pizza, like a, almost um, just pure elation. If you could, if you could channel that for me, that'd be great. Yep. Oh, yep. No, no, that's too much. <laughs> <laughs> A pizza! A Mario! <laughs> <laughs> the early Mario movies are really weird. Not, I mean, you know about the live action one, right? What? There's a live action Mario movie? Yeah, it's set in New York. Um, Luigi is Mario's son. And, oh, wow. Well. And their last name is Mario. But Mario's first name is also Mario. Mario, Mario! <laughs> 
Atlantis and the dinosaurs from an alternate universe where they weren't wiped out come through to New York and try and invade it. Nice. But enough Mario. Let's talk Jerry. New York was, without a doubt, the perfect place to visit as a fan of B-Movie. Seinfeld's origins in the state are essential to understanding the subtle nuances of the representation of all of the bees in the film. And after a while of staying in the place, you start to catch on to where some of those inspirations lay. Or is it lie? I'm not too sure. Being in New York made me feel closer to the heart of B-Movie than ever before, given that I was literally in the general area that the film is set and I instantly set out trying to find places in the film. And this Wait, is it. Quentin, why did you bring us here? Oh, this is it. Uh, this is the 67 Columbus. I guess it would be the right side of the road, though. I mean, I don't really know. I mean, there it is, I guess. That, that would be it. Uh, yeah, I guess this is, this is it. Wow, you know? what? B-Movie, right? It's Vanessa's flower shop from B-Movie. Oh! How high on your list of priorities was this? I don't know, top six? I don't know, that's pretty in interesting. I mean, that the movie had signs coherent enough to find a fictional flower shop. That's... Uh... I mean, I think it's cool. Yeah, you know, you might not respect that. There are no flowers for the bees to pollinate. I mean, whatever, man. Whatever. Despite how easily I found Vanessa's flower shop, there weren't a lot of other places to visit in relation to the film. I was able to stop by a McDonald's around 14th Street, where I confirmed my suspicions that the signs are not as big as they are depicted to be in the B-movie commercials, but I went to New York to take a break from thinking about B-movie commercials, so I was soon off to find other notable things to do in the state. One must-see for any Jerry Seinfeld fanatic is Tom's Restaurant near Columbia University. For those of you who are not aware, this diner was used for exposition shots in Seinfeld's live-action sitcom, well, Seinfeld. Because of that, Tom's Restaurant has remained exactly the same from the outside, while also serving a sort of a dedication to Jerry's work. I'm just gonna let footage of the place play for a minute. Yeah. The food there was pretty good. The first time I visited, I had a shake and a burger. Both were fantastic. My only complaint was there was just too much of it. Oh, these pants are killing me. My legs are gonna really itch because I'm gonna get a, uh, I'm gonna get a vertical shot. Yeah. It's uh, really taking in the hole. I'm gonna fuck with, fuck with your viewers. <laughs> I'm gonna get some, thank you. I'm gonna get some Dutch angles up in here. All these viewers have to be getting pretty hungry right about now. If I look wet, it's because I had just walked through this horrible storm, which was so bad that my umbrella actually snapped in half. I mean, I've been in weather like this before, but usually this kind of thing happens much earlier in the year. It's totally rare to see something like this in June of all times. Something felt afoot in New York. Something was just off. Maybe it had been like this for a long time. Maybe i just never taken the care to notice before. Eh. So the last place I want to talk about visiting is Central Park. Central Park is significant because, well, the Hive and Bee movie is in Central Park, so most of the bees that we've talked about in the series uh, see Central Park as their home. Most of the scenes that we've discussed then happen in Central Park. Central Park is the heart to the story of the Bees and Bee movie. It's why this series exists. It's why I'm able to make a living off of YouTube as I do. It's just an important place, okay? And I found Central Park to be... balanced. Everything was calm. It felt so complex, but so organized. It really was a place that I absolutely found myself in love with. Here's a funny bit of observation. Walking through Central Park, I couldn't help but catch onto the fact that all of the trees were still without leaves. Everything was brown, drab. Again, this is shocking for June, but I suppose the cold weather and the constant rain was to blame. Greenhouse effect or something like that. But here's a thought. What if the dying plants at the end of B-Movie come not from the bees quitting, 
but from the seasons changing. It certainly ends up looking the same. Sitting in Central Park and just soaking in the atmosphere helped me understand something about why I love B-Movie as much as I do, and more importantly, why it's a goal of me to review individual bees from B-Movie. Because while it might seem like these anthropomorphic cartoon insects might have lives totally disconnected from our own, this couldn't be further from the truth. B-Movie is brilliant because it's so closely inspired by the lives of real New Yorkers just like Jerry Seinfeld. Without people like us, there would be no B-Movie. And in a way, all of us, every single one of us, are bees from B-Movie. <laughs> Hey guys, just got back from New York, uh, and I have decided to move out of my old place and into a brand new apartment. As of recent, my life has felt non-congruent, and I, I hope this fixes it. So I packed up all my valuables, and I thought we could review a bee really quickly. Uh, where did I put this? Please! Please, help me! No! <laughs> uh, it must be in the front seat. <laughs> Silly me. Ah, uh, here it is. <laughs> Shut up, or I will come back there, and you do not want that. Yeah, here we go. So this is a drone. This is a drone, Barry Benson. And we've got a... Uh, he's got an instruction manual. They made this in 2007. I've heard a lot of people say that they have these... Quiet! Hey, man! What's up, Quinn? It's been a long time. Uh, I'm just looking at this bee. Oh, that's a... It's a fine looking bee you got. Yeah, Barry Benson? Yeah, Barry B. Benson, yeah. Hey Wyatt, um... Didn't I kill you? Does that mean... Yeah, I think yeah. so. No, oh. Yeah. Yes. Yes? I, I that, killed you. That sounds... Right? Yeah, you did. Okay, yeah. so, um, how, what's, any life updates? Uh, or, what's going on? What, what's happening, man? No, I'm sort of, uh, like a, a, you're Vector? I don't know exactly. You're I don't a ghost. know exactly, I don't know, well, I prefer if you didn't say ghost, but. Why aren't you transparent? You're saying because I'm a, I'm a ghost. You're right, that was offensive. I just, I've never met a real ghost, I just basically... Oh, yeah, I bet you haven't. It's, I can tell. <laughs> so if I touch you, will I go through no, you? No, no. Don't do it. I don't think that's funny. Okay. Or okay. I don't know what to say. This is really weird, man. Not, for, I mean, not for me. I don't... <laughs> why do you have, you're making it weird by making this a... Do you wanna you wanna help me review this bee? Yeah, let's please. What do you think of it? Uh, anatomically correct. To what? The cartoon? Like, this is what No, this is what bees look like, I suppose. <laughs> I mean it's bigger than a normal bee. Yeah. And bee movie good. So you it's never forget. There's a little copyright thing right here. It says like 2007 DreamWorks or something. Wow, 2007. It's got this fancy... And look at this like space age technology. Tiny little legs. Yeah. Landing gear. 
I'll, um, I also got some replacement parts somewhere, but... Oh yeah, I've got some replacement parts, so if it, you, this bee breaks down, you can fix it right back up again. In a, in a tick, absolutely. We should probably hurry this up, because I, I think he's going to pass out. All right. Um, but, um, yeah, it's got a little manual. It's it's cute. Only thing is, after over the years, it's, uh, it's lost its... Tr I've tried to charge it. I bought it on eBay, and it just doesn't work. That's a shame, so but it doesn't we can test the aerodynamicness. Flat work. Hot damn. And that's exactly how a bee would do it. <laughs> yeah. I'm impressed. Landed on his feet. So Wyatt, um, I just want to say about the whole thing where I murdered you in that car and chopped your body into tiny pieces. Um, oops. I don't care. I All forgive right. you. Can you pass on now? Uh, I don't know. Could you stop making jokes about that? Or... I'm sorry. I've just never met a ghost before. I, I didn't I didn't mean to be offensive. I just hope you're fine with all this. Wait, just move. Move past. Good luck. Um, I did the thing again. I'm sorry. It's good seeing you, Wyatt. I hope I'll see you around. Around. I'm gonna go to my apartment. Look after that bee. Will you shut up? We have to go now. Somewhere in the depths of the internet, if you know just where to look, you'll come across a very peculiar video. It's called, simply, Bee Movie. Imagine, if you will, a place where bees run the town hall, sweep the streets, and broadcast television. Why, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard! There is such a place. This trailer, for a movie that doesn't really exist, might initially seem like a B-movie knockoff in the style of The Little Bee or Plan B, but in actuality, this allegedly predates the existence of Jerry Seinfeld's comedy classic by several years. In short, this video might be evidence that B-movie itself is a knockoff. Our story starts in 2001. Two creators named Henrik Walgreen and Per Uranimus or something like that pulled together this teaser in an attempt to pitch it to networks. A website, still up to this day, describes the plot as following. The young curious bite, Bix Mexiferia, lives in Bibelon, a giant beehive, located under the roof tiles of the Joseph Sun family house. Bin are small intelligent creatures with emotional feelings, but by the way, they are not so different to us people. When leaving the coupon, they they must always wear yellow black striped airplane suit to look like we think they look. Bix is a media player and works in the television tower in the city sector Apodia. It is she who, during the crisis meeting in the editors, hides the idea of One With Man, a nature program of the world's strangest animals, man. The television program that becomes a huge success and forever changes the life of Bibelon. Bina begins to take after people's behavior. Queen Atabar rules in Bibelon, a strict but fair regent. She is interested in the filmed elements of the family Joseph's son. In her head, however, she has the evil messenger Cyrus, who does everything to stop Bix Melifera's amazing program. Follow on a breathtaking adventure about the people, seen from the perspective of the... And then it trails off. If it's not obvious, this webpage was not originally written in English, and I used an auto-translator, and it might not have gotten everything correct. So the story goes that these animators supposedly actually physically went to DreamWorks in 2001 or 2002, and actually pitched their project there. They were allegedly shot down because the project was too childish. Given that DreamWorks is a company that makes children's movies, it was also potentially true that they turned it down because it looks terrible. Years later, this group saw the DreamWorks B-movie come to be, and ran to the press to claim that their ideas had been stolen. 
It is obvious that DreamWorks developed Seinfeld's script after presenting the idea, says Emil Markzak, one of the Swedes behind Bibelon. My theory is that people at the film company have come up with the ideas for Seinfeld without telling them that they originally came from us. These claims were obviously substantially unfounded, and there was no evidence that anyone who had worked on B-Movie had ever even heard about Bibelon. Given that, most people at the time pretty easily dismissed this. Except for the Swedish press, who ran wild with this, interviewing Seinfeld at numerous moments during his touring for the film. All of these quotes are hilarious. I'm doing my best not to laugh and taking it as serious as I can, but it's a little bit hard. It is entirely possible that someone came up with the idea about making a movie about bees. I'm trying not to smile. I know they're serious and probably feel stunned in some way, but today for the first time I saw a picture of the bees. They're funny! It should be said that I translated this from a Swedish article, which was obviously translated from an English interview, so that's probably way off. Seinfeld's point was simply that both groups had attempted to make movies about bees, and that any similarities beyond this was completely coincidental. The people behind Bibelon said that they intended to wait for the movie to actually come out before they sued, and since nothing ever came of this, you can only imagine that the two projects turned out to not be too similar. However, in many ways, the press drama shifted Bibelon into the B-movie lexicon. So I think it's obviously best that we sit down and review these bees. In the trailer itself, we see a considerable amount of characters set up, but most of them look kind of similar. The only one that stands out is this guy, who reminds me of Buzzwell for obvious reasons. But our main bee, of course, is Bix. Our female main character, who ventures outside of the hive to film a documentary about human life. She is joined by Cameraman B, not unlike the Cameraman B we analyzed some time ago. The animation of this movie could certainly have used some work. A lot of it is imposed over stock footage, which tends to look bad, especially when that footage is frozen in place, which looks really obvious. My favorite shot is this one where we see the bees land on a toy castle. I think it's just a rather charming effect that gives some credence to the idea of this world. In the end, Bibelon might be superficially similar to B-Movie, but it's nowhere near as iconic or memorable. Despite this, I can still honestly say that I respect the bee shown in the movie. Because of this, I give every single one of them a 6 out of 10. I've been Quentin Reviews, and that's all you be. Tiny Bumblebee on Big Bumblebee. Hey now, you're an so a while ago, I was at this party of sorts, and I ended up meeting with this guy who was really into DreamWorks movies. And we got to talking, and the topic of Brian Hopkins came up. And of course, I had to ask him, what's your favorite Brian Hopkins cameo? He said the airplane security guard from Boss Baby. So I stabbed him in the neck with a fork. Brian Hopkins is a DreamWorks editor who on numerous occasions has had small cameos in the films that he has worked on. In B-Movie, he actually ended up having two roles. One as the TSA agent at the end of the movie, and the other as a bee. While unnamed in the scene in question, this character, according to the credits, is named Sandy. Sandy Shrimpkin. This bee appears in a scene where Barry and Adam approach Buzzwell to see what job they want in the honey industry. Sandy seems ecstatic, and when asked what he's received, he responds, Picking the crud out? Whoa. That is stellar! Wow. A cool element about this scene is that the paper Sandy's holding actually has a lot of detail in it. At the top you can see a Hunnix logo, which is pretty cool, and it actually reads, Picking the crud out. You just know that it was someone's job to work on little stuff like this. And somewhere in a computer folder DreamWorks must exist dozens upon dozens of B-movie detail pages, just like the one we see here. Speaking of detail, I think it's been a while since we stopped to appreciate all of the detailing and the costume work for these bees. For those of you who don't know, when making the movie, Jerry Seinfeld asked that all of the bees be given clothes which exclusively exist in black and yellow. They accomplished this in the film while still making each costume look different. Adam's fairly odd parents-like tie combined with his suit gives a professional look. Barry's yellow and light black sweater is a very homey look. This cross-eyed dude gets a shirt with vertical stripes just to mix things up. And of course, Sandy gets a regular striped sweater with a collar popping up above that. God, there is so much to take in at every inch of the frame. If you honestly want to know what I have to say about Sandy, it's that he, uh, he doesn't really matter at all. Uh, he doesn't add anything to the scene. He doesn't hinder it in any way. He's just there. Alright, thanks for watching. I put no artistic merit into this video and I really didn't care about the topic. Bye! Let me set this up for you.
It's one of the most emotionally resonant and important moments in all of B-Movie. Barry B. Benson, having just learned about the Honey Crisis, jumps onto a van which takes him directly to the source of the problem, where he discovers thousands of enslaved bees in false hives. In the heat of the moment, he flies down to one of the apartments shown in the hives and speaks to two bees in particular. These bees, clearly man and wife, are unnamed in the movie, but Barry acts as if he might know them and asks them why they've moved there. That's when the male bee explains that he had to follow their queen, which leads to the queen bee joke and the reveal of more beehive walls being removed. Now who these bees are and why Barry seems so casual with them might seem not even a mystery to you, but it's boggled my mind for the longest time, that is, until I sat down and watched the fully cinematic edit of the cutscenes in Bee Movie The Game. As we've discussed, B-Movie the game attempts to show scenes from the movie as recreations of sorts. But from a realistic point of view, I prefer to look at them as alternate reality variations of the same scenes, playing out with minor alternate paths, but still within the same logic of the world. In the B-Movie game version of this scene, Barry is accidentally gassed and wakes up in the same apartment as before, apparently having just been rescued by two characters, Harry and Irene B-Man. These are not the same characters from the movie. Instead, Barry points to two passed out bees, who are clearly the same character models as before, and identifies them as his uncle Howard and Aunt Fran. Isn't it weird that Barry has two canonical uncles in the B-Movie universe, but that all bees are cousins? The choice by whoever made this game to create two brand new characters of Harry and Irene B-Man, while still showing the movie versions of these two passed out, is so weirdly bizarre. I'm not sure why they didn't just go with the movie characters. Those two are clearly modeled to look like them, and, and since they had the models, they could have just used them. But I guess there is something about Howard and Fran having these cute neighbors who come over to look over the place when they pass out that I think is kind of fun. I just don't understand why this scene needed to be changed. But at least we can say in changing it how they did, they solved one of the biggest mysteries of the original film. Anyways, these four bees bring a unique lore to the B-movie cinematic universe, and it's interesting how both the game and the movie diverge, and yet how they come together to paint a more clear image of the situation. With that, I've been Quinn Reviews. And that's all, you bee. I remember so strongly two weeks ago when I reviewed Sandy Shrimpkin, a minor bee from the first act of the film. More specifically, I went on a minor tangent about the amount of detail seen on a piece of paper held by Sandy. My intense nostalgia for this classic video made me want to follow up in this review by specifically pointing out and discussing what I like to call scenery bees. Scenery bees are bees who do not actually appear in the film as real people, but instead are represented by inanimate objects in the story. The most iconic of these would probably be the tuna can bee, which Barry briefly hides next to while he's first talking to Vanessa. This bee was also featured in the trailer, given that Barry's reaction is one of the most comedically perfect in the entire film. However, most of the scenery bees featured in the story don't actually appear in the human world. Instead, they are mostly actually seen within the hive in the first arc of the story. The first time this occurs is one minute into the runtime, when we see Barry inside of his bedroom. Here we see two posters. The first is for a race, the Tapello 500. Obviously, this is a play on the race Indy 500 and the kind of tree, Tapello. The other poster is for a movie titled The Killer Queen. This is notable because it's the only physical, in-canon appearance of the Queen Bee design, which we have spoken about in previous videos. You can clearly see how she's set apart from all other bees, and it looks incredible on a poster. Many bees are mentioned or teased in the detailing of bee papers. For instance, the bee paper boy from the infamous Honey Addict scene is selling a story with the title, Bee Goes Berserk, Sting 7, Then South. Given that this scene is trying to play off of the supposed egalitarian nature of all life in the hive, indicating that a metaphor for mass shootings also exists is quite a dark moment. The title of another, held by Barry's father and Adam, reads, Frisbee Hits Hive, Internet Down. <laughs> It also reuses the image from the poster before, identifying the central racer as Buzz. However, the best part of the paper is an advertisement for a bee pizza service. Buzz Gorno's Pizza, 450-555-4433. Gotta have it! It also seems to include a tiny tiny drawing of a bee pizza boy, which is just so adorable. Look at all the tiny bees on the screens when the pollen jugs fly in, they're so cute! Also, this is a clock that's painted to look like a bee. Perhaps the two most interesting examples of scenery bees come into play during the graduation scene. As Barry and Adam sit down, we see a golden statue of a pollen jock holding the world. 
with the petals of a flower circling it. This is a play on the infamous Atlas statue, and is our first look at a pollen jock. It furthermore represents how important they are to the hive. In fact, it's actually heavy foreshadowing for the biggest theme in the movie and the final story arc. The work the bees do with flowers is so important that it keeps the earth in balance. In keeping this flower afloat, this bee is keeping the world in check. However, in my opinion, the best scenery bees in the movie are the bees circling the Hunnix logo as Barry and Adam exit the ceremony. Aww, look at them! They're so cute! I didn't quite know how I wanted to end this video, so I thought we could really quickly sit down and look at some some old uh, B-movie fan art of mine. Um, so, so right there. I did this about a week and a half ago, and it's pretty good. Yeah, you got a little berry there. Uh, pretty happy with that. All right, thanks for watching, guys. You, uh, uh, bye. So long, get paid, and all that as it goes. Only shoot. Okay, so I just saw the Bumblebee movie, and it was great. However, I feel like they should have credited Jerry Seinfeld. I mean... Okay, this character has B in his name, it's like B-127 or something. Barry B. Benson has a B in his name. This character, he lives in a, another world that's different from Earth, and he ends up leaving and landing on Earth, and he, he forms a bond with a human woman, and then the world might get destroyed if he and this woman don't stop. Oh my god, it's just copy and paste B-movie. I mean, I think it's, I think it's kind of sad. Anyways, let's talk about the pollen jacks. There aren't a lot of bees more universally important and artistically diversified as the pollen jocks. These well-bred, roided-out beasts are the bees who are allowed to leave the hive in the story. It is this group which pressures Barry into leaving after they catch him pretending to be a jock. It is also they who coach him on the outside world before he is caught in a tennis ball and eventually goes missing. From what I've gathered, there are two jocks in the franchise who have actual names, those being Jackson and Splits. Additionally, there is a third jock who appears often and seems to not have a name. These bees notably have a role not just in the first and final acts of Bee Movie the Movie, but also in its merchandising. Here we see some McDonald's toys showing the characters all off, and of course you've got the Pez dispenser, but what amuses me most is the official Bee Movie DVD, where the cover shows the exact same pollen jock being repeated several times. Like we wouldn't notice. The pollen jocks are important because they're somewhat antagonistic to Barry, but we still learn to appreciate them as fully rounded characters. Their cool demeanor makes us respect them as much as the Hive does, and when they come to support Barry, even by making him the captain of their team, we see them not in a negative light, as we might have from the start. It's like the statue we talked about before truly shows. The pollen jocks support the flower, and with it, the world. I've been quitting reviews, and that's all you be. Today's video was once again sponsored by IsAbeVagodaDead.com, your one-stop shop for discovering if Abe Vigoda is dead. Check the link in the description to find out more. Sometimes, the end of everything can itself hold something great. So it's a general trend with recent movies that instead of being dull and just listing off names, it's generally a hip and cool idea to mix up how you show the names off, while movies like those in the Star Wars franchise avoid this for consistency to previous norms. Generally, filmmakers like to make the imagery of credits just as recognizable as the regular content otherwise would feature. And B-Movie is certainly no exception, as the filmmakers decided to have various cartoon bees flutter around as the text transitions throughout the names involved. The earliest examples of these bees are seen pulling letters into place, forming names and whole lines of credits in doing so. And one does a cute little motion where he bumps a bit of the text when it's not aligned right. Hans Zimmer worked on the music for B-Movie? What the fuck? As this group of bees pulls together letters, a bee smoker approaches, causing them all to flurry off. Next, we see a series of credits appear on a balloon, which one bee pops, leading into a bee which tries to cross the road but slams into the window of a car. Then we see a bee stuck on a spiderweb, who escapes and knocks the D off the credits, bumping down the spider. This continues as we see a bee jump from window to window of an apartment complex, exploring as he goes. 
Finally, the main bulk of the credits begins crawling across the screen, and as it does, we see several bees fidgeting with hive octagons, implying them working on honey in the hive. Finally, a single bee pulls up the Paramount logo, before dancing across and showing the DreamWorks logo, making this the final bee to ever be featured in Bee Movie. It's such a bittersweet moment to see this movie end, but to then see something beautiful and creative and awesome come out because of that. I... I, I want to thank whoever is responsible for this part of the movie. And the thing is, I don't know who that is. I don't know if I should thank Jerry Seinfeld or the artists who specifically worked on this. So, I guess I should just stop and perhaps thank everyone who worked on this incredible movie, because it is the greatest film of all time. So thank you guys all so much. With that, I've been quitting reviews, and that's all you be. It's Christmas, everybody! Which means, as you know, that I have to make a Christmas video, and I always struggle to make a Christmas video because I cover the movie B Movie, and I... I don't know how to make that Christmas themed. I mean, it's now been more than a year since I did my video on B Larry King, and and that video has gone down as, as quite infamous as me just trying to force that into being a Christmas video, and... And so this year, I, I really wanted to, to do something special and Christmassy, and, and after a while, I finally came up with an idea. I got myself a Christmas present. I, uh, I hope you'll excuse... I hope you'll excuse the fan. Uh, my computer has a big problem with overheating, so I'm just gonna let it go if that's alright. Alright, so I got myself a few presents, which I think you guys are gonna be interested in. Uh, just to get into the holiday season. So, I hope you guys are ready for this, because I'm really excited to show this to you. It's, it's, it's really big for me. <laughs> it's B-Movie antennas! Alright, so, uh, the thing about B-Movie is there was no consistent, like, documentation of the merchandising. So it's you, you find these things on like eBay and you have no way to prove if they're if they're legitimate or you know, they're probably it's almost certainly legitimate. But you have no way to prove the history or what company made it, there's not a lot of info on it. You just know that this is an official piece of B movie merchandising which simply exists. And uh this this actually would pop up in weird places in the promotional material. Like I actually believe that when Jerry Seinfeld went on Oprah to promote the movie, he had her wear these very same uh, antennas, which is such a, an oddball thing, and it's got this cute little uh, tag on it. So, we'll just take off the Santa hat and put on the, the B movie antennas. Hell yeah! Hell yeah! This is the best gift I've ever gotten. And I got it for myself. You gotta give yourself those things sometimes. What I love so much about these is that they complement my biggest theory that I recently came up with uh, during my New York trip. That being, the Bee Movie is so incredible and you can connect to it so easily because all of the bees in Bee Movie are people themselves. And, and thus, in a way, we connect to these characters because we are also bees. And this... this... Th this gift, it allows me to accept my own bee sona to accept that I am a bee to uh y you know cuz bee movie so so i guess you could consider that this little christmas special this little gift is me reviewing myself because with this gift i truly have become as much a bee as any other character we've talked about in this series and this itself would be a damn good christmas present to get myself but i'm going to one up it are you guys ready for this? Because I don't, I don't think you're quite ready for this. They're B-movie shoes! Oh my god, I was so lucky to find these. They're, um... They're Converse, and they are official B-movie licensed shoes. Um, and they're really incredible. And on the side, it just... They're very simple, they're just black and yellow. 
On the side, they say B-movie. And on the sort of the lip that goes above the top of your feet, it says All-Star. And that excites me. I don't know why, but it feels important, you know? Like that's, there's something to that. And I really like that. These are just the fanciest damn things. Uh, the only problem is, these were the only pair I could find, and these, this might even be the only size that you can really get these in. And they are 9.5 got men's shoes, and I wear a size 14 because my feet are gigantic. <laughs> so, this is a, I mean, I'll try and put them on, it won't work. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's going to be in now. So this is more of like a symbolical gift to myself. Something to put on the shelf as decoration. But oh my god, these are so rare and I'm so happy I found them. Uh, so this was a quick Christmas update video. I wanted to tune you guys in on everything going on. And uh, this video is sponsored by Audacity. The brilliant audio recording uh, software which did not pay me to do this segment. I just really like them. Alright, so check them out in the link below, and with that, I've been Quinn Reviews, and that's all you be. Benson has a lot of family members. We're going to review them. What? In between this shot and the last shot, I got naked. Barry's father was actually a bee whose design saw a sufficient amount of dedication from those working on the project. The filmmakers wanted him to be recognizably similar to Barry, yet still rather distinct. Given that it also took a while to get Barry's design squared in, you can easily guess that there are a lot of incarnations of Barry's father that phased in and out of use during production. The character's real name is Martin Benson, and there are a few things we learn about him throughout the various pieces of B-movie media. For instance, we learn from B-Movie the Movie that when he was younger he was a stir, and he expects Barry to follow suit in the family tradition. Son, let me tell you something about stirring. You grab that stick and you just move it around, and you stir it around. You get yourself into a rhythm. It's a beautiful thing. We also know from B-Movie the Game that he was let go from this job due to a rather tedious dispute. Now go down there, son, and show him you're a Benson. Don't do that! Your father didn't leave on good terms! For the millionth time, <sighs> Janet, I did not steal those post-its. Martin is voiced by Barry Levinson, a man who additionally directed several episodes of Seinfeld and Superman, a web series dedicated to advertising American Express. The man isn't commonly much of an actor, and one can only assume that Jerry Seinfeld latched onto his presence in person and insisted that he play Barry's father in the movie. Martin is, of course, married to Barry's mother, Jeanette Benson, not to be confused with Jeanette Chung. Jeanette Benson's design is one of my favorite of all the bees in the movie because it actually includes a pun of sorts. You see, her hairstyle is actually one from the 1960s, which was at the time known as a beehive. The bickering of these two around Barry is an extremely common thing throughout numerous sequences in the film. And the fact that they're so perfectly able to bounce off of one another is a key feature as to why B-Movie works as a movie in the first place. But there is one family member of Barry's who brings his household to life more than anyone else. That being... His weird uncle. I dated a cricket once in San Antonio. Man, those crazy legs kept me up all night. That chiwa. Barry's uncle serves no role. He contributes nothing to the movie, and all he really does is make every scene he's in feel a little more weird. 
And that's brilliant, because this is exactly what it's like to hang out with your family members. The gist of this whole discussion is that Barry's family is pretty cool, and you should check them out. Well, I've been quitting reviews, and that's all you be. I'm gonna go cook some spaghetti. On the 10th anniversary of B-Movie, the 14th of December 2017, the New Statesman released an article which included interviews with several of the people who were involved in B-Movie. There, each person talked about their role in the film, several stories from behind the scenes of production, and in some cases, the potential longevity of the franchise. Jerry and I talk about 20 times a day, and we discuss constantly about possibly doing some other B stuff. Instead of a future film, he says they've spoken about creating eight webisodes. One of the things that I always wanted to put in there was I wanted an obese bee that had to be cut out of the hive by fire bees, he says, listing other jokes he'd like to expand on. There would be a bee beard. That's like the worst thing you could do to bees. That was almost a racial thing, you know. A Jeff Bezos, the first billionaire bee. And a bee army. Their weapon would be a giant mosquito. As recently as yesterday, Jerry and I were talking about the idiotic bee stuff, you know? The interview made a lot of people in the B-movie community very excited about the potential of more content being released. But, in the coming year, we've heard nothing. As someone whose entire livelihood is based around the existence of B-movie and the need to find more B-movie content to cover, I am making this little short video simply as a plea. A plea for more bees. B-Movie is one of the greatest cinematic universes to ever come to life. Its characters lovable and its world fascinating. Every time I watch this film I notice something new. Be it the cards in the background zooming by or the subtle way that the honey glistens every time you see it. And we've earned more of that. We deserve more of that. Like this article points out, it doesn't even have to be a movie. A series of shorts showing other bees in the hive or even the world going about their day. Hell, think of all the unproduced bees we've talked about in the past. Who would be perfect for segments like these? A whole webisode about the queen bee or the Santa bee along those lines. Here's another idea. I've recently seriously gotten into theme parks, specifically those operated by Disney. Now, I've never actually gone to any of the Universal parks, mainly because they have nothing that really appeals to me. I'm not a Harry Potter fan, and all their Simpsons stuff looks kinda weak. And it seems like they're always closing their classic attractions like Back to the Future The Ride. But imagine if they went back and started adding content based on the classics. Shrek, Over the Hedge, and most importantly, B-Movie. An entire B-Movie ride that would introduce unique bees for just one story, giving me ample material to cover in my show. Imagine something like Back to the Future The Ride where you'd actually physically be visiting the hive in the movie, and you'd meet all the worker bees, and something goes wrong, and Barry flies in to help you. Hell, even if DreamWorks doesn't want to make any more B-movie content, I could see Barry and the other characters maybe having cameo roles in other films. It's sort of lightly implied that Over the Hedge and B-movie are part of some cinematic universe, so maybe other films would feature the two stories crossing over. Another thing I'd love to see is new merchandising come out for the film. I look at things like Star Wars and Transformers, and I get so jealous of all the cool new stuff they get every year. Meanwhile, we have nothing. This is going to be shocking, but did you know that there actually hasn't been any B-movie merchandising released since 2007? I've been a part of a lot of fandoms in my life, and few have left me feeling as frustrated and forgotten as B-Movie. I mean, I've built up this massive community because of my videos discussing the lore of this series, and yet DreamWorks refuses to acknowledge or appreciate this market before them. And I think that's sad for them more than anyone else. Be sure to subscribe if you want. That's all you be. What is a bee? This is a question of... <laughs> Let's try that again. What is a bee? This is a question which I constantly have to bring up when discussing the topic of this project. 
On a factual basis, the definition of a bee is direct and easy to understand. But I find that culturally, people tend to mix up bees with similar animals in the same way that we might find it hard to tell apart an alligator and a crocodile. The key example is, of course, wasps and hornets. Are these bees? Well, no. But to most people, bees, wasps, and hornets might as well be one and the same. This is ignorant, and in the world of B-movie, it would likely be seen as very, very racist as well. But all that aside, it's strange that this is a detail that B-movie goes out of its way to never address. Consider that in films like Maya the Bee, the beef between the various bee species is a key plotline. The fact that Jerry Seinfeld's project never addresses this is extremely notable. This was, however, partially rectified in the B-movie sequel, B-movie The Game. As we've discussed numerous times before, the gameplay in B-Movie The Game is illustrated as retellings or flashbacks of key events in the film. But additionally, new unseen stories set during the film are also shown. One of the most important of these is the extra storyline featuring the corrupt Southern lawyer Leighton Montgomery. Behind the scenes of the trial, it seems Montgomery is trying to obtain secret material which could take care of Barry and all the bees for good. And Barry, basically acting as a spy, attempts to sneak through with Vanessa to stop him in secret. To do this, he disguises himself as a fly, which is another interesting detail worthy of recognition and analysis. I would love to see a custom Funko Pop of Barry in this costume one day, or something else of the sorts. Anyways, Barry sneaks into Montgomery's office and works his way into a safe, where a tape recorder sits. On said tape is a recording of the lawyer making notes to himself, at the end revealing that this was all part of his plan all along. Pick up dry cleaning before six, arrange a deposition for the Luco case. Oh, and make sure to clean the mortal remains of one Barry B. Benson out of my safe. It seems he was dumb enough to fall into my trap. Behind Barry suddenly appear several massive figures, disguised very close to the regular bees, but also recognizably different, with their big furry coats and reflective helmets, as well as the unique wings and markings on their clothing. The hornets are also notably written to be very dull and frankly stupid, delivering small talk that makes this all so very clear. Barry quickly runs from the office, escaping from the confrontation, if only for now. And the plot only thickens from here, as it turns out that what Montgomery has is essentially a virus that has the ability to change the taste of physical honey, giving it a taste identical to that of Brussels sprouts. Montgomery has stockpiled his own collection of honey and plans to hide it away and infect the rest, leading to him gaining a monopoly on honey and the world being forced to come to him exclusively for the stuff. The Hornets arrive just as Barry figures this out and informs him that they've been hired by Montgomery to stop him. This doesn't stop Barry for long, as he brings an end to Montgomery's plan by poisoning his private honey supply and presumably destroying his ability to do that to all the other honey in the world. Going a little off track, are you guys aware of the mini-games that are playable in B-Movie the game? While you also work to complete the main story, you can also choose to drive around the hive and try out various tasks. This seems contradictory to the basic plot of the original film, where the bees had to pick one job and stick with it for good, but I have a theory for how all this fits in. After the end of B-Movie, the roles in the hive are changed up meaning that one could switch from job to job at will. The segments in this game, which are canonically supposed to be reenactments for an interview show, are essentially state propaganda, encouraging the use of this new system. That or it's a video game that I'm reading too far into. I bring this aspect of the game up because of how cute I frankly think it is. For every job Barry does, he's shown in a different outfit, and as you finish these levels, you get to unlock them for good. Barry is blue now! I'm not sure why! But he looks pretty good! So there's one other bee-like species that appears in the game, and that's the wasps. They actually appear early on, when Barry has discovered the human-ran hive and is taking photos for evidence. The wasps suddenly appear and begin attacking at random, and it's up to Barry to stop them. Note how this new species are again similarly designed to the bees, yet are polar opposites to the hornets. They're sleek, cool, and with suave, Australian voices. Barry takes these creeps out the same way he does every other bug in the game, by shooting at them with a pollen gun until they sneeze so much that they decide to give up and leave. Hey, does this remind anyone else of Robotech Battle Cry? The choice by those working on B-Movie the Game to introduce new stories and elements to be explored is why B-Movie the Game is truly one of the most unique things ever produced for the franchise. It's an obscure piece of media, making it all the more a joy to watch. Seeing these characters go on new adventures and storylines makes me even more sad that Jerry Seinfeld did explore this world only so briefly, because there are so many other stories to tell.
And I must emphasize that I love, love, love the B-movie game B non bees They're just so charming and such a surprising inclusion. Like many elements of the franchise, it's sad that we don't get to see this concept explored further. How do wasps, bees, and hornets tend to interact in the real world? Is there a parallel to how some humans interact with others? Or is it an entirely original idea? It's kind of hard to say without an official voice on the matter. I wanted to end this video by telling you guys about my Patreon. I've recently updated some of my tiers, so now if you donate $6, you'll end up in my credit scrawl. This money will help me pay my rent and take care of Caleb, so any contribution means a lot to the future of this channel. With that, I've been Quinn Reviews, and that's all you be. Get your game on, go play. Day of the stress test B. When Barry and Adam are first being led through Hunnex by their tour guide Trudy, she begins to tell them about all the numerous jobs in the hive which help their community prosper. One of these is a team which stress tests objects. In this example, a helmet meant to withstand various attacks to bees. As he's repeatedly attacked by these, Adam asks Barry what he presumes the person is paid. Barry's response? Not enough. <laughs> Later in the film, we see two scientist bees looking over the same stress test bee, who they give the all-clear in the experiment. Okay, Dave, pull the shoot. This does not go well. No! Dave is important because all of his scenes are funny. They represent that bees are smart and useful. That's all you be. Guys, have a pizza in there. It's pineapple anchovies found in the dumpster. Enjoy. <laughs> He's not even chained to anything anymore. This used to be a challenge. So there's something we should probably be talking about that I've frankly been putting off for a while, and that's what happened almost a year ago, near the end of May 2018. As you all certainly know, every year in May, I dedicate the entire month to covering B-movie commercial bees and nothing else. And that month, in an attempt to cover as much material as possible, I frankly overworked myself to the point that instead of reviewing one commercial, I reviewed myself. I've just done so many videos during the past two months, and specifically so many videos recently about B-movie commercials that I need to get away. It was after this that I took a trip to New York to really find myself, and uh, I've taken a lot of breaks since then because I, I, uh, I really needed it, but now that I'm getting back into the flow of reviewing bees all the time, I keep thinking about how much I failed you guys with that video because I really didn't cover the topic very well. Not only did I fail you, not only did I fail myself, but I failed the bees that I was reviewing that video. So strap in, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a very special early edition of Monetized May. Starting over for those who never saw the travesty of my first video. The B-Movie TV Juniors were skits that Jerry Seinfeld filmed with his friends, which makes fun of all those involved and even the motivations of the company for allowing the film to be made. In a shocking twist, the company then aired these as commercials on television, despite the fact that they were not fit for this at all. People got bored of these very quickly, and these were extremely infamous at the time. But as an oddity, a study of the mentality of the filmmakers, I find the B-movie TV juniors to be exceptional and fascinating. One of the oddest segments surrounds Jerry Seinfeld discussing with the audience the great scare of knockoff products, in a way predicting the existence of the numerous B-movie knockoff products which would be released after this. Trying to make them aware of the issue, he runs into the streets of New York and randomly picks up a DVD labeled B-movie, which he then plays revealing a Spanish sitcom named after his film, which is extremely low quality. In my last failed attempt to cover this topic, I uh, sort of missed the skit step where I had someone translate the segment so I could understand it. You see, I didn't take Spanish in high school. In fact, I took Chinese, and I didn't learn anything in that class. 
Although I did make the Chinese teacher cry, I have a lot of white guilt. Anyways, I'm bringing this up because I want to thank these Twitter users for helping me by translating this clip. And those are Alberto at Guardian Yoshi, Murin at Miseron Fire, and Radimus Rodriguez at XZ94. With that, let's analyze these fake B movie knockoffs from an official B movie commercial thing. So the segment starts off with two bees sitting in a room, one a father bee and one a younger bee. The father bee says that there's no room for the younger bee. Suddenly, a woman runs in and cries for the boys not to fight over her. The female bee walks over to the cheap wall, which she bumps into, causing the men to break character and tell her to watch out. She cries that they are abusive, and at that moment, another bee enters stage right. Oh, I'm honey! Well, this is it. I found the best bee in Bee Movie. The cast continues to fight until the woman declares that the newly entered bee is her lover, causing the father bee to reply, <laughs> The female bee storms off screaming. Cut to black. I am so glad that I decided to revisit this one. What can I say about this cast that isn't obvious? It's a brilliant piece of fiction within fiction that represents knockoff media more accurately than anyone could have ever hoped to. The father bee is just controlling enough, the female bee just overzealous enough in her acting, the younger bee just quiet enough to leave a great impact in how little of an impact he leaves, and the final bee? Oh, I'm honey! Best bee, best bee of all time, best bee, 10 out of 10, best bee. Thank you guys so much for sticking around. I promise in the coming months I'm going to do my best not to have any more psychotic breakdowns. With that, I've been Quinn Reviews, and that's all you need. Today, ladies and gentlemen, is a very special day, and for more reason than one. First of all, today we are going to be covering none other than Adam, Barry's best friend in the movie and one of the most important bees in the entire franchise. But, more than that, today is actually very special in my life. Two years ago on this very day, I began to explain to my co-producer, Caleb, uh, B-movies' various explorations of the themes of sex and religion and politics. Uh, to which he responded that B-Movie is a bad movie that he doesn't care about and that I obsess about over it to an unhealthy degree. So I hit him over the head with a wrench and tied him up in my basement and he's been my personal slave ever since. The follow-up to this was surprisingly mundane like everything in my life. Uh, I told his family that he had joined the military, which they believed for some reason. It's been a fantastic quarter of a decade, but I mean, I'm, I'm not here to talk to you guys about my personal life. I'm here to review one of the most important bees of all time. What is there to say about Adam that isn't already known to us deep in our hearts? Well, maybe that he's Barry's best friend. Maybe that he helps him through a lot. Maybe that he loves cheese in a can. But personally, I think there's so much more. In B-Movie the Movie, Adam serves the role of Barry's longtime childhood friend who has been with him through it all. And by it all, I mean the few days that they've been alive as they quickly go through their education. But Adam represents something greater than that. Adam is in tune with the hive status quo, and in fact embraces it with total excitement. Being a regular bee, working on the Krellman, picking away droplets of honey, and then eventually dying as an old man is all he could ever hope for. Adam basically comes to represent the establishment that Barry is leaving behind, and because of this their clash is very much symbolical. When Barry starts to push against all of that to strive for something else, Adam tries to change his mind. He tells Barry to think B, and to not run from his own world. Of all the designs in the B-Movie art book, it's the early look for Adam that shocks me. The reason is that it looks like someone copied the equivalent design from a Goofy movie and hoped that no one would notice. Luckily this wasn't in the final pick, but imagine if it had been. Certainly, it would have been an entirely different experience. Adam is of course voiced by Matthew Broderick, a close friend of Jerry's who was likely brought on because of that. I'm often criticized Broderick's performance. I think it's a little underdeveloped, a little too deadpan, like he's reading the lines for the first time and he doesn't really understand what he's saying. When Adam gets shaken up a little, Broderick really pulls through, but a lot of other times his animation is just clearly compensating for his lack of performance. Adam's main notable trait is the sacrifice he goes through for the sake of Barry. In B-Movie the Game, we see him put himself in harm's way while trying to find information on the corrupt lawyer's secret plot, and he turns out to be very important to finding an essential clue. 
Later, when that same lawyer taunts him in the courtroom, making racist statements and attempting to taunt him into stinging him, Adam snaps and does just that. Because of this, he ends up hospitalized, being siphoned honey with his stinger replaced by a tiny sword. He then distracts the court as Barry and Vanessa gather their surprise evidence. And in the end, they win the case for Honey and the Bees. Adam shows up throughout the rest of the final act as well. But I find that the most interesting aspect of his life is what happens after the film. Well, in the final scene that we're shown, Adam is living out his dream of working on the Krellman for a new era of the Bee race. He also appears in the game, where he's shown still being embarrassed by a stinger as he runs off. But my favorite epilogal appearance of Adam comes in What's the Buzz, the novelization of B-Movie, where in the final page we discover that Adam is now a tour guide in the same way that Trudy was at the start of the film, introducing the hive to new bees. We are now on the Benson Flex time work schedule, Adam said to a tram full of young bees. He now led a tour of the Hunnix factory, which includes job rotation and weekly day off. All the bees were busy and happy. So that's Adam, one of the most important bees into the entire franchise, someone who doubted Barry but then brought him back to the hive and helped him along the way. Truly, one of the most important and fascinating bees of all time. With that, I've been Quinn Reviews, and that's all you- Oh hey Caleb, what's up? I've broken out. That's right, motherfucker! I broke out! Oh, it's about you for the past two years! You kidnapped me. You, you held me for two years. You let me burn while your house was burning down. You freaking, you fed me what I presume to be human remains. And, and, and worst of all, you made me watch Friends. You made me watch season three of Friends for uh, just tons, but only the middle episodes. You said you Ross! I presume! And... I'm gonna all that... All that's... All that's fucking over now! All that's done! All that... As, as soon as I get done with you here, I'm gonna run out that front door, I'm gonna call the cops, I'm gonna call the FBI, I'm gonna call the fucking CIA too! The fucking Child Protection Services! They're all gonna come down on your ass! Then I can move on! Then I can move forward! Is that a gun? Yes. Can I think of something cool to say before I die? That sounded pretty cool. Even this doesn't make me feel anything anymore. This is where I live now. So, at the height of B-Movie's fame, it had a lot of tie-in material. And one of the most notable tie-in materials for us is this. B-Movie, I can find it. Find more than 80 hidden things. Now, uh, the reason this is notable is because, of course, on this show, we review B-Movie one B at a time. And this entire book is built around having a lot of unique bees for us to discover. So let's flip through this real quick and check out what we can find. Got the logo with Barry Klingon there for damn life, dear life. And here we sort of have, this is like a brief representation of orientation. There you've got um, the boss bee, of course, uh, Dean Buswell. Barry and Adam, and they're all being shown around the hive. 
And we have things we're supposed to find. We're supposed to find a busy bee, which is a good pun because that's a thing that people say. And uh, let's see, where is this busy bee? You'd think this wouldn't be nearly as hard as Waldo. There he is, right there. That's our busy bee. Waldo found. And look at this, this guy's on a computer. He's got a bee on a piece of paper. Maybe that's one of his kids. Well, I mean, the queen births all the children, but maybe that's... I think they adopt, I don't know. Um, and look, they've got this great representation of that iconic photo of the pillar. They're sitting up there eating their lunches, which seems to be buns. Uh, it's a good female bee. You don't see a lot of those in the main narrative of a bee movie. That's the patriarchy in action. And this is a jealous bee. You can tell that from his face. There's some motivation there. I believe perhaps he's plotting a political assassination of Dean Buswell. He's got these glasses. I suspect this is a man who could have been a pollen jock, but he fell through the ranks, and that's why he has these glasses. And he hates Dean Buswell because he didn't become a pollen jock. This is Barry when he gets knocked out into the court. Uh, and in, this is a lot more active than the actual movie, and a lot more crazy, I think. Um, you got Barry here on the tennis ball, and you got a pollen jock, and I think those are the two main bees. Uh, and another two pollen jocks, and I think it says moose blood is around here somewhere, but where could he be? There he is. Waldo found. And there's young Rick from Rick and Morty. Here we're at the store, and there's tons of merchandising that we we're supposed to find. But here's Barry, that's the important thing. And these are all honey containers, which have been stolen from the bees. And you can see tiny bees on these honey containers. And this says we can find actually what I think is a kind of honey candy, which has a bee on it as well. So let's look for that. There's a tiny bee up here on this ad, right there, and here we go, here's the honey candy with the tiny bee. And uh, that's brilliant. Leave in the comments if you can find any bees that I've missed. This is just a flower shop and I think Barry's the only bee. He's standing on the Law 101, that's cute. Uh, here's Barry at lunch, at, at dinner. Of course, this is what draws her boyfriend to insanity because, because he's at his spot in the dinner table. A cute detail is this, new, is this news thing that says, Free the Bees, based on Barry's political activism. And so this does cl clearly tie into the, the bee movie canon. What are we looking for here? Um, camera, daisy, flag. This is the news. He's talking to the news. I think he's just one. Yeah, Barry wins court case against the humans. So we're looking for honey candy. Yeah, he's enjoying that while he can because it's just become illegal. In fact, I think Barry's eyeing him out. Ice is about to bust in and take that guy away. <laughs> B writes now. Oh, time is post. B victory. B's victory. Another guy with illegal honey candy. They've won, so this is one of the final pages. There's tons of bees to find here. They're having a party. I think this is uh, maybe Chung, the famous news reporter. This guy's on a, a bee roller coaster, and it has like a bee flying bus, which is cute. And I think this guy's controlling the bee ride. So much to find here. Um, pollen jock, uh, bartender bee. Scuba diving bee. This bee's reading a newspaper. Baseball bees. Uh, this is another bee ride. This is like an amusement park for bees. Roller coaster. And these are bees that you could ride as a bee. Which I wouldn't... I wouldn't ride a human ride as a human. But we're supposed to find coaster bee. There he is. We're supposed to find slider bee from an alternate dimension. And he's right there. Skateboarding bee. Right there. Juggler B, who has a lot on his hands right there, he is flying, which is why he's up in the air and not sliding down. Picnic B, that's a puzzler. There she is. And Ice Cream B, uh, that's not him, but whatever. I, I just like how that B is stupidly designed. And Motorcycle B, somewhere in there I presume.
There's Barry. And uh, yeah, we're supposed to find the pollen jacks. That wasn't hard. Uh, the flight attendants, the people flying the plane are drunk or something. Barry, that's why Barry's flying it. Yeah, people on board don't care. There's a bird on the wing. And uh, this is the final scene. Peace, tranquility, the end of one of the greatest films of all time. Palm Chuck's flying around. Enjoy summer. Enjoy summer indeed. Enjoy summer. So that's that book. Um, I've been quitting reviews. And that's all you be. Ah, <laughs> oh, Barry, I found you. <laughs> Barry B. <B>. Benson. <laughs> Helen Jack. This is the big one, ladies and gentlemen. The one we've all been waiting for. The video essay that I've been waiting my entire life to make. Today, once and for all, I'm going to be analyzing the one and the only Barack B. Benson. How should one ever hope to approach discussing the single greatest figure in any fiction ever created by any human? Some have made the case recently that Barry himself might be a Christ figure, with his numerous miracles including talking to humans, flying a plane, getting it in with a human, and of course walking on water. But I prefer to see it another way. I believe that Jesus Christ is a Barry B. Benson figure. Barry B. Benson's might and worth is so incredible that he overshadows God himself. So the origins of Barry are actually quite simple and rooted in the story of how B-Movie came to be. The story, which I'm sure many of you have heard before, goes that Jerry Seinfeld originally pitched the movie as a joke to Steven Spielberg, only for him to accept the pitch immediately as he lined up a representative at DreamWorks to talk it over. Jerry essentially ended up making a movie accidentally, going through with it because he felt like he had to. This setup is like something that could have potentially happened in his sitcom, and so it's no wonder that Seinfeld mocked the process so harshly in the DVD features. By Jerry's own admission, the process for creating Barry wasn't that complex. He literally took his name, Jerry, changed one letter, and then proceeded to make a character pretty much identical to himself. The designers working on the film had a problem dealing with this at first. They initially made Barry look exactly like Jerry, but as a bee, but they were eventually pushed in a different direction. It took a while, but once they found Barry, they knew it was him. So let's talk about Barry's motivations in the movie and how they might relate to Jerry Seinfeld. In the movie, Barry finds himself growing up in his Central Park hive, barely understanding or caring about the outside world. However, when he realizes exactly how dead-end and closeted his community is, he decides that he must venture out into the hive and find things for himself. I like to see this as a bit of an analogy for Jerry's experience when leaving the nest, and thus his family in New York. At first, people tell him that he's making a mistake, that he doesn't need the outside world. But he pushes through these people anyway, thinking that they're just overprotective or elitist. But as he does things outside of that world and accomplishes a lot, he realizes that there is indeed something special about back home, and that by being pushed all that way, he's lost a great amount of what makes him, him. It's important to note that while Jerry Seinfeld was working on B-Movie, he insisted to stay in New York and help raise his family. One might suggest that Jerry himself found himself being drawn back to the mentality of thinking B, as he recognized what made the outside world special, while also making sure to stay close to home in a sense. It's that balance which Barry finds that truly puts him at bliss in the end, of venturing out while still making something of himself without forgetting about where he came from. One might ask, what are the political motivations behind writing the film? Personally, I have my own theories. Barry is raised in an idyllic, near-perfect society where everyone works for the good of the colony and nothing ever goes wrong. When he heads out into the human world, which is hectic in a beautiful way and a horrifying way, he becomes enamored with the people and how they push through in this world. His view of the culture starts to fall apart when Vanessa takes him to a place quite special, 
the supermarket. It's here that he sees all of the honey stolen from his kind and begins to believe that a conspiracy might be taking place. Barry comes to a conclusion that most always appears when one reads into a company or topic. When the bottom line is the dollar, there usually is some injustice or inequality hidden below the surface. Jerry Seinfeld creates a fictional world where people care about the great inequality and injustice that exists at the core of capitalism, and a world where people caring means that it's immediately fixed and rectified. A world where the will of the people actually matters, and not that of evil massive corporations whose only goal is to make as much money as possible. A world where the people win and the dollar loses. Hey, this guy's a commie! The other half of the message is an environmental one. As the pollen jock holding up the world represents, bees are so essential to life on Earth that if they were to stop, the results would be catastrophic. Now, in the narrative, they stop because they don't need to work anymore. But in reality, this possible future reflects the sudden death of many bees, who started to pass in bulk starting in the 20th century. A world without bees threatens balance, and in short, leaves us devoid of both honey and life. Barry's infatuation with Vanessa is too peculiar to gloss over, given that it's also the main thing that most people know about the film. I think this is actually realistic to something that I often go through. Barry is infatuated with Vanessa not just because of what she's like, but because of the world that he imagines coming with her. If Vanessa had just been another cousin living in the hive, Barry wouldn't have thought twice about her. But because the idea of Vanessa comes with this perfect existence in the human world, he uses his idea of her as a simple prop. But in a way, he's putting himself through this to escape from his regular, stressful life and to hope for something new. Of course, this very down-to-earth understanding of Barry's relationship with Vanessa and his mentality about growing up and leaving the hive, it doesn't really matter because the true core of B-Movie is just that it's kind of stupid and dumb and that's why it's great. I often wish that the creators of the film had gone with the original ending, where Barry was going to end up not as a pollen jock, but as an astronaut in space. I think this version of events totally emphasizes the ridiculous nature of the story. It's a B-Movie about a bee named Barry B. Benson. It's incredible and stupid and should embrace that as much as possible. As a protagonist, Barry B. Benson is perhaps most comparable to Marty McFly from Back to the Future and the Back to the Future animated series. He's the most relatable and laid-back figure who is thrust into the adventure by pure luck, good or bad, and he learns to question everything around him just as the audience does. At first, he's the joke of the hive, the bee that pretends to be a pollen jock and then claims insane conspiracy theories about the humans stealing their honey. But by the end, he's much more than that. He's the martyr who saved the bees in an unprecedented court case, the bee who sought to save the world and put life back on it in the brink of catastrophe, and the bee who landed a plane being held up by thousands of other bees. He then becomes a lawyer defending the rights of sentient animals in the DreamWorks cinematic universe, but also a pollen jock, literally bringing life to Earth every single day. Again, I, I think it's undeniable. Jesus Christ is a Barry B. Benson figure. Jerry Seinfeld needs to revisit this franchise not just because we need more bees, but because Barry B. Benson is the greatest character that Jerry has ever played. It's who he was destined to be, for better or for worse. Jerry owes it to himself to take on that role again, to make a great story, and to bring joy to our hearts like Barry brings pollen to the flowers. With that, I've been Quinn Reviews, and that's all you be. Hey, it's me. It's your boy, Quentin Reviews. Yeah, I'm, I'm living in the forest now. And, uh, it's a funny story. The reason I came to this forest is, uh, I think like five months ago I came here on a trip. Drove here in my car. And, uh, someone stole my car while I was here. But they left all the B-Movie merchandise I had in the car, so I kind of hid it in the forest. Little did I know I would decide to live here in the future, so, uh, now I thought we could uh, go through all this and just study all this B-movie merchandise uh, for this one. Uh, one of the best finds I've ever had in this line of work has been uh, this. This is uh, a bunch of B-movie McDonald's stuff, perfectly kept as it was historically at the time. I'm guessing someone worked at McDonald's and just took all this home with him one day. He must have been a B-movie fan, and they, he sold it on eBay. So, uh, this is the stuff they would give to kids, and, uh, I really love this. I mean, look at this. This is, um, this is, uh, I have like five of these. I hate to 
ruin a collectible item like this, but I'm going to show you how they would they'd pop it open like this. Then they'd fold this in like this. And there you go. Now you have a, a B movie a B movie uh, McDonald's box. And there were a lot of cool little features like you can I don't know if you can tell, but you can pop Barry's head out. Head out so when you close this Barry's head pops up. I'm not gonna do that, but uh, then there were these cute little uh, uh, get buzzing about uh, real B facts. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Good Sorry to bother you. <laughs> if you want an extra box. <laughs> <laughs> um, a bunch of a bunch of facts on there, and. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess the idea is you would glue these together because it's like, there's the question, there's the answer. I don't know why they're next to each other. You'd think they'd be on the other side, but maybe that costs too much money. This, of course, has the infamous Barry sticker. Barry approved. I've got no problem with this! Which is a beautiful way to approve something, by just like being vaguely appreciative of it. And uh, I guess they'd have these little stickers to give out to kids. Milk cartons. And of course, uh, toys. Do you ever think about existing for as long as you know? And one day, that just ends. Um, did I show you the milk yet? I think the milk is really charming. Luckily, they didn't actually put the milk in there. This is empty. But I have a vintage B-movie milk carton now. And, uh, yeah, we got, a, we got a bunch of toys here. Hello. was a mildly better idea in my head. The spoon we've talked about before. I got this from Misaki, if you'll remember. That was a fun trip. All we know is existence. We don't know what it's like to not exist. And I think that's what's so scary about being alive. Here's more of the McDonald's stuff that fell into the bottom of the box when I tossed it all around. Yeah, I'll put all that back in now. <laughs> Here's our, uh, our B-movie Valentine's Day. You get uh, a bunch of Valentine's Day cards you can give to people, like, uh, Okay. Oh, it's all fine. Sorry, trying to get a little exercise, man. It's fine, ma'am. You're the one being normal right now. <laughs> no. B movie Valentine's Day. As you can see, uh, uh, this is have a beautiful Valentine's Day. Your sweet Valentine. You're a honey of a friend, Valentine. Bear is giving you a Valentine while also friend zoning you. Valentine, you're the bee's knees. What comes after eternity? What comes when everything stops?
Hey, Quentin, it's me. It's Wyatt. The Wyatt Receiver. I just thought I should check in, make sure everything's okay. I'm in Europe. I'm trying out some places here to haunt. There's a lot more variety than in the States, a lot more history, lots of historical buildings. I could just hang around forever out here across the sea, out here on this Golden Isle. Yes, I love it. I don't care, I love it. Uh, listen, man, you could say I've been doing some soul searching, and there's something I never told you that I feel like I should have. I've known for a long time. I've known for a long time, and I just never had the nerve to tell you. I'm your father. I feel like you must have known all this time. When you would throw me that ball, I could see it in your eyes. They're just like mine, boy, but you've got my eyes and your mother's hips, but mostly my eyes. I just wanted you to hear it from me directly. You deserve it. I'm sorry the truth had to be hidden for so long from you that you had to kill me and see me come back as a ghost for me to finally admit this to you. Also, just to be clear, if you kill Caleb, he's gone for good. He'll never come back as a ghost like I have, so be careful with him. If you kill Caleb, it's super permanent and tragic, so watch out. Listen, son, I love you. I don't know when I'll see you again. I hope soon. Until then, think of me every time you rewatch that movie about the bugs. I love you, son. Never forget that. Depressed? I'm the furthest thing from depressed. Do you think a depressed person could make this?